convey the main ideas, and you will need to read the formal proof in the book yourself to get the full picture. It is also important to see formally written proofs so that you have a model to follow when you write proofs of your own. If you're formally taking the course, you will want to bring your book with you to class because we will be doing examples and exercises in class, and the book will be a useful resource to have. If you're not in the class, I would encourage you to take the time to do the exercises in the book anyway. You will learn much more from working through these exercises than you would from just watching the videos or reading the book alone. As is typical of many higher level math books, the exercises are not designed where you look for an example in the book that's pretty similar to the exercise and just copy the steps. Many of these exercises will require you to think carefully about the content in the section so that you actually understand it. If you get stuck, you may need to seek out other resources such as the Math Stack Exchange in order to get you going again. If you comment on the appropriate video, I will try to get around to responding, but my number one priority is to my students and not the internet, and so it may take some time for me to get there. That's all I have to say as an introduction to these videos. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy learning number theory. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Let's start with a simple question. What is the sum of the first n positive integers? When confronted with a mathematical question like this, your first response should be to look at some specific values of n and see if you can find a pattern. In fact, one of the most overlooked skills in math is a willingness to experiment with numbers and play around a bit. After a little bit of computation, we would be able to come up with a chart like this. After staring at this for a little while, you might see that there's a simple formula that relates n to the sum of the first n positive integers. It's one thing to come up with a formula, but it's another thing to know that it's correct. We've only checked it for the first 10 positive integers. There are still infinitely many to go. We can make the chart bigger and feel more confident about the formula, but no matter how big of a chart we make, we will always have infinitely many more cases left to check. So we need a scheme for checking infinitely many formulas while only investing a finite amount of work. Clearly, this can't happen by checking individual formulas. We can use the principle of mathematical induction to accomplish this. Here's the formulation that we will be using in this class. The principle of mathematical induction. A statement about integers is true for all integers greater than or equal to 1 if it is true for the integer 1, and whenever it is true for all integers 1, 2, 3 up to k, then it is true for the integer k plus 1. For those who have a bit more mathematical experience, you might recognize this as the second principle of mathematical induction, or strong induction. For this class, we're not going to get bogged down in the details of the differences between the various forms of induction. To understand how this works, we will think about an infinite line of dominoes. We will label all the dominoes with positive integers, each one representing a formula we wanted to prove to be true. We will also imagine that knocking over a domino is like proving the statement to be true. Our goal is to be able to knock over all the dominoes. The first condition of mathematical induction is the claim that we're able to knock the first domino over. The second condition of mathematical induction is the claim that for any k, we can knock over the k plus first domino if we can knock over the first k dominoes. For example, we can knock over the first three dominoes, then we can also knock over the fourth. If we can knock over the first four dominoes, then we can knock over the fifth, and this works for any integer k. Intuitively, if both these conditions are met, we should be able to knock over the entire line. We will use this idea to prove the formula for the sum of the first n positive integers. To prove a statement using induction, we must prove that the statement satisfies the two conditions. The first condition is known as the base case, and is often just verifying a specific formula to be true. The second condition is known as the induction step. We will assume that the first k statements are true, and then try to prove that the k plus first statement is true. We will often only need to use the kth statement, but there are other situations in which we will need more than that. Base case. When n equals 1, the sum on the left is just a number 1. And if we plug in n equals 1 on the right, we get 1 times 2 over 2, which is just 1. And this proves the base case. For the induction step, the inductive hypothesis is that the formula holds for all integers from 1 to k. And we want to prove that the equation holds for k plus 1. Everything from here is just algebraic manipulation. First, we will rewrite the sum so that the kth term is explicit. Then we will use the inductive hypothesis and replace this part using this formula. We can pull off a k plus 1 over 2 from both terms to get the desired result. There are two more statements that we will prove in class. 
The first is the formula for the sum of the terms in a finite geometric sequence. And the second is just an observation that we will use in the next section. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Based on our life experiences, we have learned to interpret numbers in a certain way. In this section, we are going to explore the idea a little more deeply with the goal of proving an important theorem about how we represent numbers. We write numbers using a place value system. What this means is that individual digits have meaning based on both the symbol and the location of the digit within the number itself. More specifically, we use a base 10 place value system, which means that the values of the numbers are built around powers of 10. Instead of writing out the number in standard form, we're going to use the expanded form of the number in order to emphasize the base 10 place value system. Although writing down the exponents on all the terms helps us to emphasize the point about the powers of 10, we generally don't write those out. In general, the expanded form of a number looks like this. Instead of working with base 10, we can also work with base 2, which is known as binary notation. The change is that instead of building numbers around powers of 10, we will build numbers around powers of 2. A consequence of this is that instead of using the digits 0 through 9, we will only use the digits 0 and 1. In order to distinguish our binary numbers from the standard base 10 numbers, we will write binary numbers with a subscript 2 at the end. The theorem we are going to prove shows that every integer has exactly one representation in any given base. We can always insist that the leading term is non-zero by just starting in a different place. However, it's possible that the trailing terms are zero. In order to help the notation in our proof, we will assume that we've dropped the terms that are zero at the end of the representation, so that the representation we use starts and ends with non-zero terms. Let b sub k of n denote the number of representations of n base k. If we prove that this value is 1 for all n, then we would have proven the full theorem. To start, let's consider representation of n as we've just described. We will subtract 1 from both sides of the equation. Notice that since the last coefficient is non-zero, we can pull out one of them and rewrite the equation like this. We can now use the formula for the sum of a finite geometric series with x equal to k on these terms to get this. This calculation shows that every representation of n leads to a representation of n minus 1, so that there are at least as many representations of n minus 1 as there are representations of n. In other words, b sub k of n is less than or equal to b sub k of n minus 1. By noting that the calculation works for any positive integer n, we can apply this repeatedly to get a whole string of inequalities. Also, b sub k of 1 equals 1, since any other representation will be greater than 1. We can use this to show that there is at most one representation of n for any n. However, we need to show that there is at least one representation to complete the proof. In order to do that, we will use the result from a previous section. For our application, we will have k to the n is greater than n. Since k to the n is a valid base k representation, we have the following string of inequalities. Notice that this shows that b sub k of n equals 1, which completes the proof. Converting numbers into base k is a matter of trying to divide by the highest powers of k possible and looking at the quotients and remainders. Rather than do this abstractly, we will work with a specific example. Example, convert 383 to base 4. We will start off by first listing the powers of 4. Notice that the largest one of these that divides 383 at least once is 256. So we will divide 383 by 256 and write out the quotient and remainder. Next, we'll divide the remainder by the next smaller power of 4 to get a new quotient and a new remainder. We continue repeating this process until we have no more remainders. The quotients give us the digits in the expansion by placing each digit into the position corresponding to the place values, and that gives us the desired representation. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Euclid's division lemma, more commonly known as the division algorithm, is an extremely important idea that is used in virtually every area of mathematics. We're going to be working with it in integers, but there are versions that work with polynomials, complex numbers, and other abstract domains. The book's proof of the division algorithm is different from most modern treatments. It's very specific to the presentation because it uses the basis representation theorem from the previous chapter.
Recall that the basis representation theorem simply states that we can write any positive integer n in any base k in a unique way. We will prove the division algorithm following the book's presentation, but then we'll also give a more intuitive geometric proof. Theorem. For any integers j and k with k greater than 0, there exist unique integers q and r such that j equals q times k plus r, and 0 is less than or equal to r is less than k. All of these values have names. The integer j is called the dividend, k is called the divisor, q is the quotient, and r is the remainder. Incidentally, we implicitly used this theorem in the previous section when we calculated the base 4 representation of 383. In fact, this theorem is just a formalization of every integer division calculation you've done since elementary school. We will work with positive values of j. Notice that if k equals 1, we can trivially identify q and r. So we will assume that k is greater than 1. We will first use the basis representation theorem to write j in the base k. Notice that we can factor out a k from all but the last term. When we do this, we end up with an expression that's in the exact form we need it to be in. We now need to prove that this representation is unique. Suppose we have a second representation of this type. We will write q prime in the base k, and then plug it in. Notice that this is a representation of j in the base k. By the basis representation theorem, we know such representations are unique, so that this must be the same representation that we started with. And this means we can just match up the terms. But after we match up the terms, we see that this means that q and q prime are the same value, and r and r prime are the same value, so that the representation is unique. The j equals 0 and j less than 0 cases will be left as exercises. When j equals 0, you can easily identify q and r. When j is negative, you will want to apply the division algorithm to the value negative j, which will be positive, and so you can apply the conclusion of the proof we just completed. The geometric proof relies on some basic intuition about the number line. Let k be a positive integer, and label all the multiples of k along the number line, capturing both the positive and negative multiples. The integer j must lie somewhere on the number line as well. If it happens to be a multiple of k, then we have j equals q times k plus 0. If not, then j must lie between two multiples of k. We can label them so that qk is on the left, and that q plus 1 times k is on the right. We can then define the value of r as the distance between qk and j. Clearly, this is less than k since k is the size of the gap between qk and q plus 1 times k. With this, we can clearly see that j is equal to qk plus r. The division algorithm is an important result that we will be using throughout the rest of this course. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Before we begin, let's take a moment to review the division algorithm, which this book calls Euclid's Division Lemma. Theorem. For any integers j and k with k greater than 0, there exist unique integers q and r, such that j equals q times k plus r, and 0 is less than or equal to r is less than k. The idea of divisibility follows very naturally from this theorem. The intuitive idea of divisibility is that it arises when there's no remainder. If we set r equals 0, we get j equals k times q, and we might say k divides evenly into j. In formal mathematics, we just shortened that language to say k divides j. The book gives a definition in terms of fractions, but we will use the more common definition that avoids them. Definition. For integers a and b with b not equal to 0, we say that b divides a if there exists an integer k such that a equals b times k. This notation is simply read b divides a. If b does not divide a, we put a slash through with a vertical bar. The book uses a horizontal slash, which is increasingly less common, but you should still be able to understand it from context. There are a number of easy examples to consider to help think about this definition. 6 divides 24 because 6 times 4 is 24. 6 does not divide 33 because there is no integer k such that 6 times k equals 33. 1 divides a for any integer a because 1 times a equals a and negative 1 divides a because negative 1 times negative a equals a. To help become more familiar with the definition, we will do a quick example proof. Example. Suppose d divides a and d divides b. Then for any integers x and y, we have d divides ax plus by. 
The proof is simply a matter of applying the definition and doing a little bit of algebra. Since d divides both a and b, they are just integers j and k such that a equals d times j and b equals d times k. If we then substitute these into ax plus by, we find that we can write it as d times an integer. If d divides both a and b, we call d a common divisor of a and b. And this naturally leads us to consider another definition. Definition. If a and b are non-zero integers, then a positive integer d is called the greatest common divisor of a and b if it satisfies the following. d is a common divisor of a and b, and if f is a common divisor of a and b, then f is also a divisor of d. The second condition is what shifts d from being a common divisor to being the greatest common divisor. It basically says that if f is a common divisor of a and b, then it must be smaller than d. The reason we use the property of divisibility is because it's more useful to use in proofs. There are a number of different notations that are used for the greatest common divisor of two integers. We will use the first of these. The book uses the second. The last one is worth paying attention to because it has a lot of practical generalizations and is commonly used elsewhere in mathematics. At the same time, it's easy to confuse that for a point on the plane. Since we won't be seeing the generalizations of that notation, there's no benefit for us to use it here. In the next video, we will look at a method for computing the greatest common divisor of two integers known as the Euclidean algorithm. It will turn out that the Euclidean algorithm gives us even more useful information than just the GCD. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Let's quickly review a couple facts before we get to the Euclidean algorithm. We will start with the division algorithm, which is called Euclid's division lemma in this book. Theorem. For any integers j and k with k greater than 0, there exist unique integers q and r such that j equals q times k plus r, and 0 is less than or equal to r less than k. There was also an example in the previous video that will be relevant here. Example. Suppose d divides a and d divides b. Then for any integers x and y, we have d divides ax plus by. Lastly, we will review the definition of the greatest common divisor of two integers. Definition. If a and b are non-zero integers, then a positive integer d is called the greatest common divisor of a and b if it satisfies the following conditions. d is a common divisor of a and b, and if f is a common divisor of a and b, then f is also a divisor of d. Before launching into the proof of the Euclidean algorithm, we will look at a numerical example to build some experience and intuition regarding the structure of the proof. Example. Compute the GCD of 588 and 2030. We can do this by simply finding all of the factors of 588 and 2030, and then picking the largest number that appears in both lists. But this turns out to be a very inefficient process, especially as the numbers get larger. So instead, we will use the Euclidean algorithm. We begin by dividing the larger number by the smaller number to get a quotient and a remainder. We will write this result in the form given to us by the division algorithm. We will now shift everything over and repeat this process using the old divisor as the new dividend and the old remainder as a new divisor. And we will continue this process until we don't have a remainder. The last non-zero remainder turns out to be the greatest common divisor. We will explore that claim and then prove it in general. The quotients have been put inside the parentheses for emphasis. We won't get a chance to talk about it a lot in this class, but there are some very interesting things that you can do with these values. Theorem. If a and b are integers, not both zero, then the GCD of a and b exists and is unique. We will develop the Euclidean algorithm in the process of proving this theorem. Without loss of generality, we will suppose that a and b are positive integers with a greater than or equal to b. We will use the division algorithm to divide a by b. We can write the result like this. If r sub 1 is greater than 0, then we apply the division algorithm again, dividing the previous dividend by the previous remainder. We can keep doing this as long as the remainder is positive. Notice that the remainders form a strictly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers. Eventually, we will run out of positive integers and the remainder will be 0. We will let r sub n be the last non-zero remainder. Notice that r sub n divides r sub n minus 1. Since r sub n divides both r sub n and r sub n minus 1, the divisibility calculation in the example shows that r sub n must also divide r sub n minus 2. 
But since r sub n divides both r sub n minus 1 and r sub n minus 2, we see that it must also divide r sub n minus 3. We can keep repeating this pattern all the way up the chain of equations, which shows that r sub n divides both a and b. We now need to show that r sub n is the greatest common divisor. But first we're going to rearrange all of our equations by solving for the remainder terms. Suppose that f is a common divisor of both a and b. By looking at the first equation, we can see that f must also divide r sub 1. But then by looking at the second equation, we see that f must also divide r sub 2. This pattern continues going all the way down the chain of equations, showing us that f must divide r sub n. This means that if f is a common divisor of a and b, then it must also divide r sub n, which is the required condition for r sub n to be the greatest common divisor. This proof actually accomplishes much more than just providing a method for finding the greatest common divisor of a and b. It turns out that it also gives us a method for writing the greatest common divisor as an integral linear combination of a and b. In other words, we have a technique for finding integers x and y such that ax plus by equals d, where d is the GCD of a and b. We won't go through all the details in this video, but it's basically just an exercise in algebra where we take these equations and do a bunch of substitutions. There's another method of computing x and y, and is sometimes called the magic box algorithm by graduates of the Promise program at Boston University. It turns out that the ideas here have some very deep connections with a lot of interesting number theory topics, including continued fractions, Pell's equations, and several other ideas. Unfortunately, the trajectory of this course will not take us there. But if you want to learn more about them, a good place to start is the introduction to the theory of numbers by Hardy and Wright. The remainder of this section covers more facts about integral linear combinations as well as a brief look at primes and the concept of relatively prime integers. We will explore these ideas in class. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. At the end of the last video, we mentioned that the Euclidean algorithm applied to the numbers a and b gave us a method for generating an integral linear combination of a and b that is equal to the greatest common divisor. In other words, we have an algorithm that generates solution to the equation ax plus by equals d, where d is the GCD of a and b. This is an example of a linear Diophantine equation. We want to consider the more general case in which we seek integer solutions to the equation ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are all integers. We saw from last class that equations of this form have a solution if and only if the GCD of a and b divide c. We can look at this problem from the perspective of the Cartesian plane. The equation ax plus by equals c is the equation of a line. The points x, y, where x and y are integers, are lattice points on the plane. The question of finding solutions to the linear Diophantine equation is the same as trying to find points where the line crosses lattice points. Depending on the specific values of the parameters, there may be no lattice points, or there may be infinitely many. Let's suppose that d divides c. Since d divides c, there exists an integer k such that c equals d times k. By corollary 2-2, we can find integers w0 and z0 such that a times w0 plus b times z0 equals d. We will multiply through by k. Substituting this into the right-hand side of the equation and inserting parentheses on the left side of the equation, we get a times kw0 plus b times kz0 equals c. By setting x0 equal to k times w0 and y0 equal to k times z0, we get a solution x0 y0 to the equation ax plus by equals c. Now suppose that there is another solution x prime y prime to the equation ax plus by equals c. We can set these two equations equal to each other and divide both sides by d. Notice that the terms inside the parentheses are integers since d divides both a and b. We can then rearrange the equation to get it into this form. It can be shown that if d equals the GCD of a and b, then the GCD of a over d and b over d is 1. Therefore, by theorem 2-3, we have that b over d divides x prime minus x naught. This means that there exists an integer t satisfying this equation, which can be rewritten like this. Also, by plugging this back into the equation above and doing some algebra, we get this equation. We can show by direct substitution that every pair x prime y prime of this form must be a solution to the equation ax plus by equals c as well. This result is summarized in the following theorem. Theorem. 
The linear Diophantine equation ax plus by equals c has a solution if and only if d divides c, where d is the greatest common divisor of a and b. Furthermore, if x not y not is a solution to the equation, then these equations give all the other solutions. In class, we'll look a little more closely at the geometry of this equation to gain some more insight into the problem. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic is a fancy name for something you've probably known for most of your mathematical life. You might recall creating factoring trees from elementary or middle school math classes. These are diagrams where you start with a number and try to factor it into the product of two smaller numbers, and then repeat the process until you end up with numbers that no longer can be factored. Those numbers at the bottom are called primes, and this process yields the prime factorization of the initial number. One of the easily observed and easily overlooked features of this exercise is that no matter how you factor at each step, the final factorization is the same regardless of the path that you took. That is, if you look at the final list of primes at the bottom of all the factoring trees, they'll be the same except for maybe being in a different order. This may seem completely obvious based on your experiences, but it turns out that there are many number systems for which this simply isn't true. For example, if we were to use the number system consisting of only even integers, there are numbers like 36 that we can factor as either 6 times 6 or 2 times 18, but neither of those factorizations can be broken out any further unless we use values that aren't even integers. There's an important lesson here about not letting your current set of experiences define the universe of possibilities. In fact, the discovery that unique prime factorization fails in other number systems opened the doors for new areas of mathematics, so sometimes you never know what's waiting around the corner. Here's the formal statement of the main theorem for this section. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. For each integer n, there exists an increasing list of primes p1 through pr, such that n is the product of these primes, and this factorization is unique. A couple quick points about the statement of this theorem before we prove it. First, we allow the possibility of having the same prime repeated. In some treatments, you see primes raised to various powers. I tend to think that the powers make things look more complicated than they really are, so I like what the book does here. Second, notice the primes are listed in a non-decreasing order. This gets around the problem of having to track the potential rearrangements. It doesn't negatively impact the logic of the proof in any way. The proof will proceed by induction and will have two parts. The first will prove the existence of prime factorizations, and then we will prove that the prime factorizations are unique. Notice that if n is prime, then the prime factorization is just itself. For the existence proof, notice that since the number 2 is prime, we have an immediate prime factorization for it. Now suppose that the numbers 2 through k all have prime factorizations. We need to prove that k plus 1 has a prime factorization as well. If k plus 1 is prime, then we have an immediate prime factorization, just as with the number 2. If it is not prime, then we can write k plus 1 as a product of two integers that are both less than k plus 1. But by the inductive hypothesis, we know that each of these integers has a prime factorization. This means we can substitute to write k plus 1 as a product of primes. The last step for getting a prime factorization as stated in the theorem is just rearranging the terms to be in increasing order. For the uniqueness proof, suppose that 2, 3, up through k all have unique prime factorizations. Suppose that we have two factorizations of k plus 1, where all the primes are ordered as in the statement of the theorem. Notice that p1 divides the product of the q sub i, so that p sub 1 equals q sub i for some i by corollary 2-4. Also, notice that q sub 1 divides the product of the p sub j, so q sub 1 equals p sub j for some j. Since the products are in increasing order, we must have these inequalities. But by combining them together, we get this, which shows that p sub 1 and q sub 1 must be equal. This means that we can cancel these terms out to get a factorization of a number smaller than k plus 1. By the inductive hypothesis, we know that this factorization must be unique so that the p sub j and the q sub i must exactly correspond to each other. And so we see that the initial factorizations were actually the same, proving that for all integers n greater than 1, we have unique prime factorization. The real key to the uniqueness proof was where we used corollary 2-4, which follows from the proof of the Euclidean algorithm. It turns out that in any number field where the Euclidean algorithm holds, you will also find unique prime factorization. We won't be exploring this idea any deeper in this class, but just be aware that there are places where the Euclidean algorithm fails, and this leads to other areas of mathematics. Thank you for watching this video. 
I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The topics of permutations and combinations are generally considered to be topics for a course in combinatorics. But number theory has a way of taking ideas from other areas and using them productively. We will begin by building some basic intuition about making selections. Suppose that you are trying to make simple bagged lunches at a school. All the lunches come with milk and a cookie for dessert. But the students can have their choice of a sandwich and their choice of a fruit. The sandwich options are peanut butter and jelly, turkey, or ham, and the fruit options are an apple or an orange. How many different lunches can be made? We will ignore the milk and cookie because both of those are standard in every lunch. The variety only comes from picking the sandwich and picking the fruit. We can represent the choice of sandwich in the horizontal direction and the choice of fruit in the vertical direction. What we can see from here is that we can make a grid that represents all the possibilities and that the number of options is the product of the number of options for each choice. In this case, there are six different lunch options. If we expanded the selection to include options for dessert, say a cookie or a brownie, we would end up with two copies of this grid, one for each dessert choice. Notice how this still corresponds to multiplying by the number of options for each choice. If you wanted, you can try to imagine stacking the grids on top of each other to create a three-dimensional grid, but that type of generalization runs into problems if you have a fourth option, such as choosing between milk and juice. When we have many options, we tend to use a tree for visualization. We simply list all the items vertically in groups and then connect them with lines. Each pathway represents a different meal. This is helpful when thinking about this as a process, but it doesn't provide as much intuition about why we would multiply the numbers at each step. This idea is formalized in the book as the general combinatorial principle. The general combinatorial principle. If an element alpha can be chosen from a prescribed set S in m different ways, and if a second element beta can be chosen from a prescribed set T in n different ways, then the ordered pair alpha beta can be chosen in m times n different ways. Returning to the first example with only two options, the set S is the list of sandwich options and the set T is the set of fruit options. As mentioned, this principle can be generalized to any number of selections. It's important here that the number of choices at each step is independent of the previous choices. This principle would not work if selecting a turkey sandwich meant that you also had to have an apple. The next combinatorial principle we will need is an R permutation. Definition. An R permutation of a set S of n objects is an ordered selection of R distinct elements from S. For example, let S be the set containing A, B, C, and D, and let's try to count all the possible three permutations. That is, we're looking for an ordered collection containing three non-repeating symbols from the set S. For a first choice, we have four objects to choose from. For the second choice, we can't choose the first object again, so we have only three objects to choose from. Notice that even though the specific options may be different, the number of options to choose from will always be three. For the third choice, we only have two options remaining. By the general combinatorial principle, since there were four options, then three options, then two options, we multiply those numbers together to get 24 possible three permutations. And you can see them all listed here. The next theorem provides a formula for the number of R permutations of a set of N objects. We read this symbol as n permute r. The proof is nothing more than thinking through the number of choices at each step and applying the general combinatorial principle. For the first choice, there are n options. For the second choice, there are n minus 1 options. For the third choice, there are n minus 2 options. And the pattern continues all the way down through the rth choice. At this point, there are n minus r plus 1 options. Using the general combinatorial principle, we multiply these numbers together to get the desired result. As a quick notational note, we define n factorial to be the product of the first n natural numbers. For example, 4 factorial equals 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. For convenience, we will define 0 factorial to be 1. Definition. An R combination of a set S of n objects is a subset of S containing R elements. The difference between combinations and permutations is that the order does not matter for combinations. If we look at the three permutations from before, we condense the list into three combinations by just matching up the ones that use the same symbols. From this, we can see that there will never be more R combinations than R permutations, since one R combination can be associated with many R permutations. 
In fact, this idea is applied directly into Next Theorem, which provides a formula for computing the number of R combinations from a set S. This symbol is read N choose R. For each of the N choose R different R combinations, we can generate R permute R different R permutations. Therefore, we must have this equation. Upon rearranging this and substituting the formula from Theorem 3-1, we get the desired result. The symbols n choose r are also known as the binomial coefficients and are extremely important in combinatorics. But that's a conversation for another class, so we'll end this video here. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Fermat's little theorem is an important result in number theory. It seems simple and isn't too difficult to discover through some calculations and explorations, but it has a lot of very important implications. The proof we will see is a combinatorial proof, which is a fancy way of saying that we're doing a proof by counting. Many combinatorial proofs begin by thinking about a situation that initially seems like it has nothing to do with the actual problem at hand, then it all comes together at the very end. In this video, we're going to look at a special case of the proof that will highlight the big ideas, and then we'll do the full proof in class. Theorem, if P is a prime, and n is a positive integer, then p divides n to the p minus n. We are going to imagine creating strings of beads of length p where we have beads of n different colors. We can use the same color multiple times and we have enough of each color that we will not run out. For our example, we're going to look at the case where p equals 3 and n equals 4. Since we have four choices for each of the three beads, we can use the general combinatorial principle to see that there are 4 times 4 times 4, or 64 strings that we can make without worrying about flipping the string over or other manipulations like that. Specifically, this means that these two strings should be considered to be different. Here are all 64 strings that we can make. Out of these, exactly four of them will be a solid color. We will remove these from the collection. Notice that we can take the bottom bead from any string and move it to the top to get a different string. We know that it will be different because we've removed all the strings where the beads are all the same color. Since there are three beads, we can do this three times before returning back to the original string. This fact shows that three must divide the number of strings that remain after removing the strings of solid color. Let's review the major steps of the calculation. We started with n equals four colors and strings of length p equals three. This led to four to the third or 64 total strings. We then removed the four strings that were just a single color. The remaining strings are able to be put into groups of three, so three must divide the remaining number of strings. If we think about this proof, we realize that there's nothing special about the number of colors. We could have had five colors and the logic would not have changed. This means that the proof is independent of the value of n. But we do need to think about the value p and why it's important that p is a prime for this proof to work. We'll end this video here with that open question and we'll discuss it further in class. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Wilson's theorem is a basic result of number theory that has a surprisingly large number of applications. The proof of this one will also be combinatorial, so we're going to have another set of pictures to look at and think through. Just as with Fermat's little theorem, we'll think through a specific example and then work through a general proof in class. Theorem. If p is prime, then p divides p minus 1 factorial plus 1. We can explicitly calculate the result for p equals 2 to verify that it works, so we will assume that p is an odd prime. Specifically, we will look at the case where p equals 5. We're going to think about the five corners of a regular pentagon, and we'll label the points 1 through 5 in order to be able to distinguish them. We will now think about the five permutations of the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Each five permutation gives us an ordering with which to connect the dots. For example, 3, 1, 2, 5, 4 indicates that we should start at 3, then go to 1, then 2, then 5, then 4. And by returning to the starting point, we create an object that the book calls a stellated pentagon. The word stellated is related to the word stellar, which should make you think of a star. In fact, if we choose the right five permutation, we would get a standard five-pointed star. Since each five permutation gives us a stellated pentagon, there is a total of five factorial stellated pentagons that we can draw using this scheme. However, many of these will be the same. The reason for this is that we can start from any of the five points and have two different directions that we can travel around the diagram. 
This means that we won't have five factorial different stellated pentagons. We need to divide by 10 in order to remove all of the duplicates. When looking at a stellated pentagon, it will either be rotationally symmetric or it won't. That is, some of the stellated pentagons will be unchanged when you rotate them, while others will change. It turns out that there are only two rotationally symmetric figures. These can only be generated by starting at some point and moving the same number of spaces around the diagram at each step. We will assume for simplicity that we're starting at the top. This leaves us with four possible destinations to determine the shape. But since we're creating a symmetric figure, the points on the left half are equivalent to the points on the right half. This means that we have two different rotationally symmetric figures. If the stellated pentagon is not rotationally symmetric, then it must fit as part of a collection of five stellated pentagons corresponding to the five different orientations that can be generated. At this point, we've actually completed the proof, although none of the symbols look like they correspond to the original statement at all. All the ideas are here, and it's just a matter of some algebra at this point. Let's review what happened. We started with five factorial stellated pentagons constructed from the five permutations of the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We notice that this gives us multiple copies of the same figure because we can choose five different starting points and two different directions of travel around the diagram. We removed all the extra copies so that we have only one copy of each. We were able to determine that some of them are going to be rotationally symmetric. In fact, there are 5 minus 1 over 2 rotationally symmetric stellated pentagons, based on starting at the top and using the fact that the points on the left half and the points on the right half will give the same results. We will remove those figures from the collection. The remaining figures can be placed into groups of 5 based on rotational symmetry. This means that 5 must divide the remaining total. The same proof will work by replacing the number 5 with a generic prime p and manipulating the expression a little bit. We will take a closer look at this in class. It's worth noting that the modern convention of stellated polygon yields only the symmetric shapes. That's a minor issue that nobody should ever really get into an argument about. I just chose to use language that was consistent with the book. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The textbook we're using was written in 1971. Most of it has aged well, but the section on the use of computers did not. However, when the textbook was written, they had no idea how far the technology would go in another 40 to 50 years. The fastest computers back then probably had about the same computing power as a fancy coffee machine has today. But the underlying logic remains intact. We can use computers and computer programming to perform repetitive computational tasks to give us data that we can then use to seek patterns and make conjectures. In some cases, we can also use computers to help with mathematical proofs. For this section, we're going to focus primarily on the logic of programming using flowcharts. In class, any programs we will actually build will be built using Python. But since this isn't a class in programming, there's no expectation that you'll be able to develop the code on your own. The only expectation for you is that you'll be able to follow the logic of the program. We will keep our flowcharts as simplified and minimal as possible. Here are the basic shapes that we will be using and their meanings. The oval or rectangle with rounded corners are shapes that indicate either the start or the stop of a program. The rectangles are shapes that indicate some type of calculation. The diamond is a shape that indicates some type of decision. Parallelograms are shapes that we use to indicate some sort of input or output of data. And an arrow simply represents the flow of a program. There are more types of boxes, but they really aren't that relevant for our purposes. We will stick with these basic ones and focus on the logic of computer programs. You should think of a computer program as an extremely reliable, but unintelligent minion. The computer will do what you tell it to do, but it will only do exactly what you tell it to do, and it is not smart enough to figure out what you meant to tell it to do. This can sometimes send it off into an infinite loop from which it will never be able to escape. We will practice thinking about programming by talking through some programs that perform very simple mathematical tasks for us. Let's say you want to write a program that can tell you whether or not a number is prime. Before thinking about what a program might do, you should think about what you might do. If I asked you whether 563 is a prime, what would you do? Probably you would Google the phrase, is 563 a prime? But let's pretend for a moment that your only electronic device was a calculator. Could you still determine whether 563 is a prime? Of course. You would just take 563 and divide it by a bunch of different values and look at the remainders. But which ones? And what if the number were different? Is there a systematic way of setting this up? The brute force and ignorance approach would be to divide 563 by all the numbers from 2 up to 562, and as long as none of those divide 563, we know that it must be a prime. 
There are more efficient things we can do, but we're not even going to worry about optimization at this point. We just want to focus on the process. The following flowchart demonstrates this process, and we will walk through the logic of it together. We will always start at the start, of course. The red box will keep track of our location, and the black box will contain information that we will use in the program. The first step into the program asks for an input of a value n. This is the n we're testing for primeness. It is always good to test a code with a couple of small numbers where you already know the answer to ensure that there aren't any errors. Let's try the number 5 and see what happens. Next, we'll create a new variable called k and set it equal to 2. At the next step, we've reached our first decision point. Does k divide n? Notice that we have to refer to the values of k and n that are in the box. If we did not have the appropriate variable in the box, this would cause the computer program to have an error. But in this case, we're fine. And when we replace the variables with the values, our question becomes, does 2 divide 5? Since the answer is no, we will follow the no path. This next line may be a little bit strange from an algebra point of view because k equals k plus 1 is never a true equation. But in computer programming, what this means is that we're updating the value of k by replacing it with the value k plus 1. In other words, our k equals 2 will become k equals 3. And now we're at another question. Is 3 less than 5? Yes, it is. So we will follow the arrow all the way back up and around. This takes us to a question we've already seen before. However, the values of the variables are different this time, and so we need to check the question. Does 3 divide 5? No. The process will loop back around and follow the same path until it reaches this point. Now we have k equals 5 and n equals 5, and so it is false that k is less than n, and so we will follow the no path, which outputs the statement that our number is prime before stopping. Before moving on, we should stop and think about what actually happened. Notice that at this decision, we ask the following questions. Does 2 divide 5? Does 3 divide 5? Does 4 divide 5? In other words, this part of the program is doing the actual prime testing. It tests all of the integers less than n, starting at 2. Let's look at the other decision point. At this point, we ask the following. Is 3 less than 5? Is 4 less than 5? Is 5 less than 5? This part of the program is checking to see if we've tested enough numbers yet. If there are more numbers to test, then it sends us back up again. But if we've tested all the numbers and have found no divisors, then we know that our number is prime. If we had started the program with n equals 6 instead, we would see that at the first decision point, there is a divisor. And so we know the number is not prime, and we're done. As you can see, this program seems to work. However, there is a minor flaw in the program. If we were to have n equals 2, the program will result in an error. This situation is extremely common when programming. You always need to be on the lookout for special cases that might trip up your program. It's worth spending a moment to think about how you might try to fix this program. One approach is to insert another decision point at the beginning to catch the special case. Another approach is to redesign the loop so that it tests the value of k before it does the division test. One of the interesting aspects of computer programming is that there are often many solutions to a particular problem. Once you get good at problem solvings and can make the program work, you then have the challenge of optimizing the program so that it runs faster. For example, do we really need to test all the numbers from 2 through n? Are there some values that we can skip? These are the sorts of questions that can lead to interesting problems in both mathematics and computer science, but we'll just have to leave these things here for this course. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Congruences are an extension of the idea of divisibility. Instead of checking to see whether a single number is divisible by another, we're actually looking at whether two numbers are related to each other via the divisibility condition. Definition. If c is not equal to 0, we say that a is congruent to b mod c, provided that c divides a minus b. For example, we have that 29 is congruent to 14 mod 5, since 29 minus 14 is 15, and 5 divides 15. We can also restate Fermat's theorem and Wilson's theorem in terms of congruences. The original statements are in terms of divisibility. The translation of these theorems to statements about congruences is just a matter of applying the definition. Congruence modulo c is known as an equivalence relation. This basically means that congruences satisfy properties that make them behave like equal signs. More specifically, it means that congruences satisfy the properties in the following theorem. Theorem. 
If a, b, c, and d are integers with c not equal to zero, then the following assertions hold. The reflexive property, a is congruent to a modulo c. The symmetric property, if a is congruent to b mod c, then b is congruent to a mod c. The transitive property, if a is congruent to b mod c, and b is congruent to d mod c, then a is congruent to d mod c. Proving this theorem is just a matter of checking the equations. To prove the reflexive property, we simply note that a minus a equals zero times c, and so it follows that a is congruent to a mod c. To prove the symmetric property, we simply write out what it means for a to be congruent to b mod c, and rewrite the equation to make it match the definition. The transitive property is similar. Once we write out the definitions, we simply need to combine the equations together to get the desired conclusion. We actually get even more property with congruences. They also satisfy arithmetic properties. Theorem. Suppose a is congruent to a prime mod c and b is congruent to b prime mod c. Then a plus b is congruent to a prime plus b prime mod c. a minus b is congruent to a prime minus b prime mod c. a times b is congruent to a prime times b prime mod c. To prove this, we will first translate the assumptions into equations that we can manipulate. If we add the equations together, we get the first statement. If we subtract the second from the first, we get the second statement. We can prove the third statement by multiplying the equations together, but we need to solve for a and b first. You can see that we have theorems for addition, subtraction, and multiplication. There's also a theorem for division, but it has an extra condition in it. The proof uses a statement from section 2-2, but one that was not mentioned in the videos. Theorem. If a, b, and c are integers, where a and c are relatively prime, and if c divides a, b, then c divides b. With this statement in place, we will prove our theorem. Theorem. If b, d is congruent to b, d prime mod c, and if the GCD of B and C is 1, then D is congruent to D prime mod C. Note that C divides B times D minus D prime. Then by theorem 2-3, since the GCD of B and C is 1, we must have that C divides D minus D prime. In other words, D is congruent to D prime mod C. In class, we will work through some examples and look at some alternate ways of thinking about modular arithmetic. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Now that we've established the idea of congruences, we can start to put some more language around some of the related concepts. Definition. If h and j are integers and h is congruent to j modulo m, then we say that j is a residue of h modulo m. The idea behind this definition is that we're going to relate numbers together by objects that we'll call residues. Notice that by the symmetric property of the equivalents, we can also say that h is a residue of j modulo m. Here are a couple examples. 3 is a residue of 18 modulo 5, since 18 is congruent to 3 mod 5. And negative 2 is a residue of 10 modulo 12, since 10 is congruent to negative 2 modulo 12. Definition. The set of integers r1, r2, up to rs, is called a complete residue system modulo m if ri is not congruent to rj mod m whenever i is not equal to j, and for each integer n there corresponds an r sub i such that n is equivalent to r sub i mod m. The idea behind this definition is that we can find a collection of residues that will represent all the integers modulo m in a way where we have exactly one representative for each integer. We will see some examples of this shortly. Theorem. If s different integers, r1, r2, up to rs, form a complete residue system modulo m, then s equals m. This theorem shows that any complete residue system modulo m must have exactly m elements in it. We are going to start off by defining a particular complete residue system, and then show that the given residue system can be related back to this one. We will pick the integers from 0 to m minus 1 as our initial residue system. We still need to prove that this works as a complete residue system. For any integer n, we can use the division algorithm to generate unique integers q and u such that n is equal to m times q plus u, and 0 is less than equal to u less than m. This shows that n is congruent to u mod m, and that u is one of the t sub i. Also, since the absolute value of t sub i minus t sub j is less than or equal to m minus 1, it's impossible for two of the t sub i to be equivalent to each other modulo m. These two observations together show that the set 0, 1, up to m minus 1 is a complete residue system modulo m. Now consider the given complete residue system r1, r2, up to r sub s. 
We know that each R sub i is congruent to exactly one of the T sub i, since the T sub i form a complete residue system, which shows that S is less than or equal to M. Conversely, we know that each T sub i is congruent to exactly one of the R sub i, since the R sub i form a complete residue system, which shows that M is less than or equal to S. Putting these two statements together, we see that S equals M. Normally, we use the integers 0 through M minus 1 as the complete system of residues modulo M. We will sometimes denote the set as Z sub M. We can create other complete systems of residues modulo M by exchanging any element with anything else that is a residue of it. For example, if we start with Z sub 5, we can get a new residue system by replacing 4 with negative 1 and 3 with negative 2. This new complete residue system has the property that the values are as small as possible in absolute value. We can also be less restrained with our substitutions and have the set negative 26, negative 8, 13, 41, and 200 as a complete residue system. The important fact is that every element corresponds to exactly one element in Z sub 5. There will be times when we're going to be focusing on just the elements that are relatively prime to M. This gives us another definition. Definition. The set of integers r1, r2, up to rs is called a reduced residue system modulo m if the GCD of r sub i and m is 1 for each i, r sub i is not equivalent to r sub j modulo m whenever i is not equal to j, and for every integer n relatively prime to m, the corresponds in r sub i such that n is equivalent to r sub i mod m. Basically, this is just a complete system of residues with all the terms that are not relatively prime to m removed. This list shows what these sets look like when using the set Z sub M as a complete system of residues. The reduced residue system derived from Z sub M is usually denoted Z sub M star. Notice that when the modulus is prime, that Z sub M star is just Z sub M with zero removed. This is one of many patterns that exist in the Z sub M star. We'll spend some time looking into those a little bit later. We will close this video with one more definition and a statement of a theorem. Definition. The function phi of m will denote the number of positive integers less than or equal to m that are relatively prime to m. The function phi of m is called the Euler phi function. From our chart, we can compute the values of phi of m by just computing the number of elements in each of the z sub m star. Theorem. If s integers r1, r2, up to rs form a reduced residue system modulo m, then s equals phi of m. The proof of this theorem is not very different from the previous proof. We will go through all the details of this one in class. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. A linear congruence is an equation of the form a times n is congruent to b mod c, where a, b, and c are integers. We can see that if n is a solution, then so is any other integer of the form n plus k times c for any integer k. We should not be surprised by this because we showed in the previous chapter that we can replace any integer with any other one that is congruent to it without breaking the equivalence. So rather than talking about all integers, we will look at a complete residue system. Another way of saying this is that we're going to be looking at sets of solutions whose elements are mutually incongruent to each other. If we look at the equation a times n is congruent to b mod c, we can see that it can be rewritten as a n minus b is equal to c times k which is also expressible as a n plus c times negative k is equal to b, where n and k are unknown integers. This is essentially the same as solving a x plus c y equals b, which we've already done except for the transposition of a couple symbols. We know that this equation has a solution whenever the GCD of a and c divides b, and if that's the case, we can use the Euclidean algorithm to find a solution n not k not. And once we have that solution, we can also get all the other solutions using theorem 2-4, Using the symbols from our problem, this is what the equations will look like. In fact, by the division algorithm, there are just integers q and r such that t is equal to q times d plus r, where 0 is less than equal to r less than d. If we plug this into the equation for n, we can focus on the solutions modulo c. By taking r to be the values 0, 1, 2, up through d minus 1, we get all the mutually incongruent solutions. These calculations constitute a proof of the following theorem. Theorem. If d is the GCD of a and c, then the congruence a times n is congruent to b mod c has no solution if d does not divide b, and it has d mutually incongruent solutions if d does divide b. Again, all we've really done here is reframe what we already know about linear Diophantine equations in terms of congruences. 
In class, we will work with numerical examples and get some practice solving these congruences. We will end this video with a couple definitions and a quick corollary. Definition. We say that a solution n of a congruence is unique modulo c if any solution n prime of it is congruent to n modulo c. This definition is introduced for technical convenience. We know that if we have one solution, then any number congruent to it modulo c is also going to be a solution. We're just using the phrase unique modulo c to say that all the solutions are congruent to this one value modulo c. Definition. If a times a prime is congruent to 1 mod c, we say that a prime is the inverse of a modulo c. This language comes up from algebra. We would technically be saying that a prime is the multiplicative inverse of a modulo c. Corollary. If the GCD of a and c is 1, then a has an inverse and it is unique modulo c. To prove this, we simply note that the GCD of a and c is 1, and so we can apply theorem 5-1 to see that a times n is congruent to 1 modulo c must have a unique solution modulo c. For example, 2 is the inverse of 4 modulo 7 because 4 times 2 is congruent to 1 mod 7. And if you try any other value modulo 7 and multiply it by 4, you will not get 1. If you've taken abstract algebra, this type of statement should feel familiar. If you haven't taken abstract algebra, don't worry about it. We won't be using anything from this course without developing it ourselves first. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. We've already discussed Fermat's Little Theorem and Wilson's Theorem in earlier videos. Here are the statements again as a reminder. We proved both of them using combinatorial techniques. We're going to prove these theorems again, but we're going to prove them as corollaries of two more general theorems. Theorem. If the GCD of A and M is 1, then a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Recall that phi of m is called the Euler phi function and is defined as the number of positive integers less than or equal to m that are relatively prime to m. We will now prove Euler's theorem. Let r1, r2 up to r sub phi of m be a reduced residue system modulo m. Since the GCD of a and m is 1, if we multiply each of these by a, the list will still consist of values that are relatively prime to m. Furthermore, if any two values in the new list are equivalent to each other, then we can see by the cancellation law that they must have come from the same element in the original list. In other words, the two lists are both reduced residue systems, and so they must be the same list modulo m. This means that if we multiply all the values together modulo m, the products will be the same. Since each of the r sub i is relatively prime to m, we can use the cancellation law to cancel them out of both sides of the equation. On the left side, we have the product of a multiplied by itself phi of m times, and on the right side, we have just 1. And this gives us the desired conclusion. Corollary. If p is a prime and n is a positive integer, then n to the p is congruent to n modulo p. To prove this, we first note that phi of p is equal to p minus 1 when p is prime. If the GCD of n and p is 1, then we can use this in Euler's theorem and multiply by n to get the desired conclusion. If the GCD of n and p is not 1, then n is a multiple of p, and both sides of the equivalence are 0. In either case, the congruence holds. We will now move on to proving Wilson's theorem. Again, we'll get that result as a corollary of a more general theorem. Wilson's theorem is actually just the backwards implication of this theorem. Theorem. The congruence m minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 mod m is true if and only if m is prime. Suppose that m is prime, and consider the numbers 1, 2, up to m minus 1. Since each of these is relatively prime to m, we know that if a is any of these numbers, that there exists a prime such that a times a prime is congruent to 1 mod m. Furthermore, by restricting a prime to be between 1 and m minus 1, we can assert that there is a unique element in the list that is the inverse of a. Now, it may be possible for a to be its own inverse, if that's the case, then we have a squared is congruent to 1 modulo m. In other words, m divides a squared minus 1, which can be factored. Since m is prime, we know that m must divide either a plus 1 or a minus 1, and this implies that a is congruent to plus or minus 1 modulo m. Because of this, we will remove 1 and m minus 1 from the list to leave us with just 2, 3, 4 up to m minus 2. The preceding calculations show that we can pair these elements up with their inverse. This is shown for the case m is equal to 11. What this means is that if we multiply these values together, we will get 1 modulo m. 
In other words, m minus 2 factorial is congruent to 1 mod m. By multiplying both sides of this by m minus 1, which is equivalent to negative 1 modulo m, we can see that m minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 mod m when m is prime. Now suppose that m is not prime. Then there exists an a such that 1 is less than a less than m, and a divides m. Notice that a divides m minus 1 factorial because it is an element in the factorial product. Suppose for a contradiction that m minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 modulo m. Then there exists an integer k such that m minus 1 factorial plus 1 is equal to k times m. Since a divides m, and a divides m minus 1 factorial, we must have that a divides 1, but this is impossible since a is greater than 1. This gives a contradiction and completes the proof that m minus 1 factorial is congruent to negative 1 mod m if and only if m is prime. We have now seen two very different proofs of two important theorems in number theory. What's interesting in math is not just that we have proofs of these statements, but that we can relate these statements to many other ideas. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The Chinese remainder theorem is a theorem about solving simultaneous systems of linear congruences. That is, you're given a series of linear congruences like this, and you're trying to find a single value of x that solves them all. It's not entirely clear how this theorem got its name. There is a problem in an old Chinese math book that hints at problems of this type, but it wasn't called the Chinese remainder theorem until probably sometime in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Regardless of where the name came from, the terminology at this point is standard. We will dive straight into the theorem and then do an example afterward. Theorem. Suppose m1, m2 up to ms are s integers that are pairwise relatively prime. Let capital M be the product of these numbers and suppose that a1, a2 up to as are integers such that the GCD of ai and mi is 1 for all i. Then this system of congruences has the simultaneous solution that is unique modulo m. We say that a set of numbers is pairwise relatively prime if the GCD of any two of them is equal to 1. To prove this theorem, first notice that each congruence individually has a solution because the GCD of ai and mi is equal to 1. Let ci be a solution to the ith equation so that ai times ci is equal to bi mod mi. We now define another collection of numbers ni by ni is equal to capital M over mi. In other words, ni is the product of all the mj except for mi. Notice that ni is relatively prime to mi since all the mi are pairwise relatively prime. This means that there exists another number ni prime such that ni times ni prime is congruent to 1 mod mi. This is the multiplicative inverse of ni. We now have all the terms we need to write down our solution to the simultaneous equation. We will define x naught like this and explicitly show that it works by plugging it in directly. We will substitute for x in the ith equation. Notice that mi divides nj as long as i is not equal to j. This means that when we reduce the expression modulo mi, all but one term will reduce to zero. Notice that ni times ni prime is congruent to one modulo mi, and so this expression simplifies a little bit further. Lastly, we need to remember that the ci were defined to be solutions to the ith congruence, and this completes the proof. To see that the solution is unique modulo m, suppose that y is another solution. Then we have x0 is congruent to ci mod mi, and y is congruent to ci mod mi for each i. In other words, for every i, mi must divide x0 minus y. Since the mi are pairwise relatively prime, we know that the product of the mi must also divide the difference. But this means that capital M divides x0 minus y, which shows that there's a unique solution modulo capital M. Since this proof uses a lot of existence claims, it is helpful to look at a numerical example to see how the pieces come together. Example, solve this system of simultaneous congruences. The first step is to solve each equation independently and label the solutions as ci. If needed, you can use the Euclidean algorithm to do this, but if the numbers are small like these, this can often be done by inspection. Next, we calculate the ni. Recall that ni is the product of all the moduli except for mi. For each of these values, we need to find the inverse modulo mi. Remember that we can reduce these numbers before finding those inverses. We can now build the number x0 using the formula. While this answer is sufficient, it's often helpful to reduce this modulo capital M to get a smaller solution. There are lots of free choices in this process. When calculating the ci, there are infinitely many solutions. 
We chose the least positive solution, but it's also possible to choose larger solutions or even negative solutions. The same applies for the choice of the ni prime. For example, you might have noticed that 6 is congruent to negative 1 mod 7, and so you might have taken n2 prime to be negative 1 instead of 6. Fortunately, none of these choices really matter in the end. Regardless of the values you choose, you should end up with a value that works, and it will be congruent to every other value that anyone else could come up with. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. An arithmetic function is a function that is defined on some set of integers, and that set of integers is usually the natural numbers. The Euler phi function is an example of an arithmetic function that we've already seen a few times in this course. Here's a chart of the values of this function. We can notice that there is a pattern to the values of phi when considering just the primes. In each case, we see that phi of p is equal to p minus 1. This makes sense because all the positive integers less than p must be relatively prime to p, otherwise p would not be prime. With just a little bit of thought, we can actually derive the value of phi of p to the m following the same type of logic. Consider writing out the numbers from 1 to p to the m in a grid as shown here. First, notice that this is a grid of values that has p columns and p to the m minus 1 rows. The only numbers that are not relatively primed to p to the m are the multiples of p, which are the numbers contained in the rightmost column. This means all the other numbers are relatively primed to p to the m. This is a grid of values that's p minus 1 columns wide and p to the m minus 1 rows tall. This means that we can count the total number of values in the grid by multiplication. We will derive a general formula for phi of n in an indirect manner that highlights some of the interesting techniques that can be applied to problems involving arithmetic functions. We will start off with a somewhat surprising theorem. Theorem. The sum of phi of d, where d divides n, is equal to n. This is a different use of summation notation than before. Instead of sequentially counting up, we've generalized the notion to allow for a condition on the dummy variable. In this case, the sum runs through the natural numbers d that divide n. Here's an explicit example. And if we actually calculate the phi function for each of these values and add the result, we happen to get 12, just as the theorem says. We will use a combinatorial argument to prove this in general. Let s sub n denote the set of natural numbers from 1 to n. For each element k of s sub n, we're going to write down the GCD of k and n. Here's what it looks like for n equals 12. We will group each of these elements together based on these values, and let t sub d of n be the set of elements whose greatest common divisor with n is d. In general, we're just taking the elements of s sub n and putting them into groups. Therefore, this equation must be true. We will now determine the size of the set t sub d of n. First, notice that all the elements must be a multiple of d because of the GCD property. This means that we only need to consider this list of values. Let's focus on some specific element AD. If the GCD of AD and N is equal to D, then by dividing out the common factor of D from everywhere, we get the GCD of A and N over D is equal to 1. This means that an element of the form AD is in T sub D of N if and only if the GCD of A and N over D is 1, which is the exact same condition used in the Euler phi function. Therefore, we can say that the size of the set T sub D of N is equal to phi of N over D. The last observation is that as the sum cycles through all the divisors of n, the values n over d also cycle through all the divisors of n. Here are some numerical examples that demonstrate this. This observation allows us to rewrite the final sum without the fraction and proves the result. The last step is a very common trick when working with these sums. There's a more formal demonstration of this, but it tends to be less helpful than just working through some numerical examples. In the next video, we will introduce a new arithmetic function called the Mobius function. This initially strange looking function turns out to have some very useful properties. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Before we can prove the next statement, we need to introduce a new function. The Mobius function is probably defined very differently from most functions you've encountered so far in your mathematical careers, but it turns out to be both extremely powerful and incredibly useful in number theory. We will begin by looking at the definition. Definition. The Mobius function mu of n is defined as follows. Mu of 1 is equal to 1. Mu of n is equal to 0 if p squared divides n for some prime p. And mu of n is negative 1 to the r if n is the product of r distinct primes. 
In other words, mu of n takes on various values depending on its prime factorization. If the prime factorization has a repeated prime, the value is zero. Another way of saying this is that if a square greater than one divides n, the mu of n is equal to zero. Otherwise, it counts up the number of primes in the prime factorization and takes the value plus or minus one depending on whether the number of primes is even or odd. We will now work through some of the main ideas of the proof of theorem 6.2. Theorem, phi of n is equal to the sum of mu of d times n over d, where d divides n, and is also equal to n times the product of one minus one over p for all p dividing n. The large pi notation is similar to the sigma notation for sums, except that instead of a sum, it's a product. The proof proceeds by induction on the number of distinct prime factors of n. Suppose that n has just one prime factor so that n is equal to p to the m. In the previous video, we showed how to use a counting technique to show that phi of p to the m is equal to p to the m minus p to the m minus one. Now that we have this formula, we're going to evaluate the sum. Notice that when we write out the sum, the only terms that we get are powers of p that are less than or equal to m. However, many of these terms evaluate to zero because mu is being evaluated on a number that is divisible by a square. After evaluating the Mobius function, we see that the remaining terms match the formula for phi of p to the m. The second equality follows from this by just factoring out p to the m and noting that there's only one prime in the product. These two statements together completes the proof of the base case. The induction step is hard to conceptualize in the abstract, so we will work through a specific example. The idea is that we want to see what happens when the value of n has one new prime factor. So we will write n equals n prime times p to the m, where n prime has k distinct prime factors, and p is a prime that does not divide n prime. Specifically, we will try to compute phi of 90 by writing 90 is equal to 10 times 3 squared, so that n prime is equal to 10 and p is equal to 3. Just as before, we're going to write the numbers from 1 to 90 and put it into a grid. Except instead of making rows of length p, we're going to make rows of length n prime, which is 10. This means that we will have p to the m rows, which is 9 in this example. Notice that all the columns contain values that are congruent to each other modulo 10, so that if one of them is relatively prime to 10, all of them are. The inductive hypothesis tells us that we know how many of these numbers in the first row are relatively prime to 10. In this case, it turns out to be phi of 10, which is 4, and the specific values are 1, 3, 7, and 9. But then the observations we just made about the columns being congruent to each other shows us that we must have 4 times 9 numbers listed here that are relatively prime to 10. We have not yet taken into account the numbers that are not relatively prime to the new prime. In order to count these, we will break up the rows into groups of p. In this case, we see that we have three groups of three rows. Let's focus on the top group. Which of the shaded numbers are multiples of three? We have three, nine, 21, and 27. Notice that this is just three multiplied by the original four numbers that we started with. Furthermore, each block will have the same pattern of removed terms modulo 30. There are three of these blocks, and each block has four extra multiples of three in them, so we must have that phi of 90 is equal to four times nine minus four times three. In general terms, we could write it like this. This represents the total number of terms that are relatively prime to n prime minus the number of those terms that are not relatively prime to p. Using the inductive hypothesis, we can rearrange this expression to get the right product. In the last line, we simply rolled the one minus one over p term into the product by changing the index. The proof of the sum formula is somewhat intricate, so we'll have to discuss that later in class. All the details are in the book if you want to read through it. It's just a series of algebraic manipulations, but the justification at each line requires a bit of careful thought. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. In this chapter, we've been looking at arithmetic functions, which are functions whose domain is some subset of the integers, usually the natural numbers. We've looked at the Euler phi function, which counts the numbers relatively prime to n that are less than n, and we've looked at the Mobius function, which has the unusual definition that involves looking at the prime factorization of n. There are two more arithmetic functions that we're going to look at in this section. The first simply counts the number of divisors of n, and this is denoted d of n. Here are the first few values of it. Notice that if n is prime, then d of n is equal to 2. This follows from the definition of a prime number as a number having only 1 and p as its divisors. In fact, if we think about it further, we can see that d of p to the m is equal to m plus 1, since we can easily just list out all the divisors and see that they're m plus 1 of them. The second arithmetic function is the sum of divisors of n, which is denoted sigma of n. 
Since we already have the divisors listed, all we need to do is add them up to get the values of sigma of n. Also, since we've already explored the divisors of p to the m, we can write an expression for sigma of p to the m. Notice that this is a geometric sum. All the way back in chapter 1, we derived a formula for geometric sums that can be applied here to give us a closed form expression for sigma of p to the m. Having calculated these values for powers of primes, the next obvious step is to compute them for arbitrary integers. Theorem 6.3 gives us formulas for computing both d of n and sigma of n, given that we know its prime factorization. We will prove this statement by induction on the number of distinct prime factors of k. When k is equal to 1, we have the cases that we have just discussed. So now suppose that the theorem is true when there are k or fewer distinct prime factors, and suppose that n equals n prime times p sub k plus 1 to the a sub k plus 1, where n prime has k distinct prime factors and p sub k plus 1 does not divide n prime. We need to use this notation in order to be consistent with the notation provided in the statement of the theorem. And we want to figure out what the prime divisors of this number n are. Suppose that d1, d2, up to dt are the divisors of n prime, and consider this chart of values. The divisors of n prime are written across the top of the chart, and the divisors of p sub k plus 1 to the a sub k plus 1 are written down the left column. Every divisor of n is listed exactly once in this chart. We can see this since every divisor of n will have some power of p sub k plus 1 in it, where that power might be 0, and whatever we are left with after factoring out the powers of p sub k plus 1 will be some divisor of n prime. As an explicit example, here's how the chart looks for n equals 90, where n prime equals 10, p equals 3, and a is equal to 2. If we pick an arbitrary divisor of 90, such as 15, we could break that number into a product of two terms, one of which divides n prime, or 10, and the other of which is a power of p, or 3. Once we do that, we can see that this term appears in the chart in the corresponding position. We can also go in the other direction and pick an arbitrary value in the chart and see that it comes from the product of two terms, one of which divides n prime, and the other of which is a power of p. Now that we know this, we can see that there are d of n prime times a sub k plus 1 plus 1 divisors of n. And we can now use the inductive hypothesis to get the desired result. Similarly, we can add up all the values in the chart to compute sigma of n. Although this initially looks messy, notice that by factoring out the individual powers of p sub k plus 1, we get a consistent sum that could also be factored out. Notice that this sum is the sum of all the factors of n prime, so it can be represented as sigma of n prime. Then we can apply the inductive hypothesis and see that the result follows upon making the substitution. We can make a simple observation about these formulas by comparing them to the original formulas we got for powers of primes to get the following corollary. All of the arithmetic functions we've seen so far are a special class of functions known as multiplicative functions. We will close with the definition of this and a statement of a theorem. Definition, an arithmetic function f of n is said to be a multiplicative function if f of m times n is equal to f of m times f of n whenever the GCD of m and n is 1. Theorem, phi of n, d of n, sigma of n, and mu of n are multiplicative arithmetic functions. We won't prove this in the videos, but it just comes down to looking at the prime factorizations and remembering the condition that you must break the product into relatively prime pieces. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The Mobius inversion formula is a theorem that shows that there exist deep relationships between arithmetic functions that may not look that similar. Basically, if you imagine the entire universe of arithmetic functions, there's a way to create pairs of them by applying a special type of transformation. This is just one example of a much larger type of relationship. But before we can get to the proof of the main theorem, we will prove a useful result. Theorem. The sum of mu of d, where d divides n, is equal to 1 if n equals 1, and 0 if n is greater than 1. This is obviously true when n equals 1, so we will look at the case that n is greater than 1. Suppose that n is equal to p to the m, where p is a prime. We can compute this explicitly because we can easily list all the divisors of powers of primes. This is actually somewhat indicative of what happens in the general case. Let n equal n prime times p to the m, where p does not divide n prime. We will use the same trick as in the previous video to list all the factors of n. If d1, d2 up to dt are the divisors of n prime, then the chart below contains all the divisors of n. The sum of all d dividing n will contain one term corresponding to each element in this array. But we can also view each row as its own sum over the terms d dividing n prime. 
Here's how that sum looks. Notice that since p does not divide n prime, for any d that divides n prime, we have mu of p times d is equal to negative mu of d. Also, notice that mu of p to the a times d is equal to zero for a greater than or equal to two, because p to the a times d is divisible by a squared prime factor. Therefore, we have a whole collection of terms that reduce to zero. Once we get to this point, we see the cancellation happens immediately, and we're done with the proof. We can now proceed to the main theorem. Theorem. If two arithmetic functions, f of n and g of n, satisfy one of these two conditions, then they satisfy both conditions. This is what we mean by pairing them up by a special type of transformation. If you have one function, then you can essentially define the other using this relationship. We will first prove that if the first formula holds, then the second formula must also hold. Suppose that f of n is equal to the sum of g of d where d divides n. We want to work with the second sum and show that it is equal to g of n. Let d prime equal n over d and notice that the sum over all d dividing n is equivalent to summing over all pairs d and d prime such that d times d prime is equal to n. We can now substitute the formula for f of d prime. We will now take a step that looks a little odd, but follows the same logic as before. We will let h equal d prime over e and use this to rewrite the second sum. Now we will rearrange the sum. Since the product e times h is equal to d prime throughout, we can combine the double summation into a single sum. Finally, we can swap the order of the functions in the sum end and break the sum apart into a different combination by taking h prime equals d times h and undoing the previous few steps. We know from the previous theorem that this sum is 1 whenever h prime is equal to 1 and equals 0 whenever h prime is greater than 1. When we set h prime equal to 1, we see that we have e is equal to n in the outer sum and this is the only term, so the whole thing reduces down to g of n. It can be helpful to work through some concrete examples to understand how the indexing of the sums works. Here's how it looks when n is equal to 6. As you can see, there is a lot of information here and a lot of calculations. However, this is the type of proof where you really need to work through the details yourself and make sure that you can convince yourself that these sum manipulations actually work out the way they're supposed to. As you can see, it's not something that you can glance through quickly and assume that you really understand it. But once you work through it, you can see that it's just fancy manipulations. The proof of the other direction is very similar, but we won't talk through those details in this video. They're all contained in the book. In class, we'll talk a little bit more about this pairwise correspondence and its generalization, and we'll also look at arithmetic functions that we've already seen in light of that. We'll also prove that if one of the functions in the pairing is multiplicative, then so is the other. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Before we begin, we're going to review some terminology. Here's the definition of a reduced residue system. Definition. The set of integers r1, r2, up to rs is called a reduced residue system modulo m if the GCD of ri and m is 1 for each i, if ri is not congruent to rj modulo m whenever i is not equal to j, and for each integer n that's relatively prime to m, there corresponds an ri such that n is congruent to ri mod m. We noted in the video for that section that the notation z sub m star is often used to denote the reduced residue system built from the set zm by removing the elements that are not relatively prime to m. This notation is not used in the book, but is very common in modern mathematics. Here are a few of those sets written out explicitly to remind you how they look. For each value of m, we can look at what happens when we take powers of the elements in z sub m star modulo m, here are examples when m is equal to 5, 9, and 10. There are some patterns that we can immediately observe. The first is that for any a in zm star, a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. We actually already knew this, as it's just Euler's theorem from section 5, 2. But you might also notice that some elements reach 1 sooner than that. This leads us to our first definition. Definition. If h is the smallest positive integer such that a to the h is congruent to 1 modulo m, we say that a belongs to the exponent h modulo m. The language in this definition is a little bit dated. Not many people use the phrase belongs to the exponent h these days. So we will use a more modern language and introduce a different definition. In fact, in several places in this section, we're going to reword things to frame them in a way that uses modern language. We will retain the numbering to allow for easy cross-referencing. Definition. If h is the smallest positive integer such that a to the h is congruent to 1 modulo m, we say that a has order h modulo m. 
For example, this would mean that the order of 1 modulo 9 is 1, the order of 8 modulo 9 is 2, the order of 4 and 7 modulo 9 is 3, and the order of 2 and 5 modulo 9 is 6. Theorem. A to the b is congruent to 1 modulo m for some integer b, if and only if the GCD of a and m is equal to 1. Suppose a to the b is congruent to 1 modulo m, and let d equal the GCD of a and m. First, observe that there exists an integer k such that a to the b minus km is equal to 1. Next, observe that since d is the GCD of a and m, we have that d divides a and d divides m, so that d must divide a to the b minus km. Therefore, d divides 1, and so we must have that d is equal to 1. In other words, the GCD of a and m is 1. Now suppose that the GCD of a and m is 1. By Euler's theorem, a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m, and hence a to the b is congruent to 1 modulo m for some integer b. Theorem. If the order of a modulo m is h, and a to the s is congruent to 1 modulo m, then h must divide s. Suppose that a to the s is congruent to 1 modulo m. By the division algorithm, there exist integers q and r such that s is equal to hq plus r, where 0 is less than or equal to r less than h. Now notice that by substituting this in and simplifying, we find that a to the s is congruent to a to the r modulo m. By assumption, we know that a to the s is congruent to 1 modulo m, which implies that a to the r is congruent to 1 modulo m. But since h is the smallest exponent for which this happens, and r is less than h, we must have that r is equal to 0. In other words, h must divide s. Definition. If g is an integer, and the order of g modulo m is phi of m, we say that g is a primitive root modulo m. Looking back at the charts from earlier, we can see that 2 and 3 are primitive roots modulo 5, 2 and 5 are primitive roots modulo 9, and 3 and 7 are primitive roots modulo 10. If you look, you'll see that for each of these elements, the various powers of it cycle through the entire reduced residue system. That observation takes us to the next theorem. Theorem. If g is a primitive root modulo m, then g, g squared up to g to the phi of m are mutually incongruent and form a reduced residue system modulo m. Suppose r and s are chosen between 1 and phi of m, with s less than r, and that g to the r is congruent to g to the s modulo m. This implies that m divides g to the r minus g to the s. In other words, m divides g to the s times g to the r minus s minus 1. Since we know g and m are relatively prime by theorem 7, 1, we must have that m divides g to the r minus s minus 1. But this means that r minus s is a positive integer less than phi of m, such that g to the r minus s is congruent to 1 modulo m. This is impossible since the order of g is phi of m. Therefore, g to the r is not congruent to g to the s modulo m, and the listed elements are mutually incongruent. And since we have exactly the number we need, we must have a reduced residue system modulo m. If you've taken a course in abstract algebra, this section should seem familiar because all of these proofs are usually done in that course as well. An alternate name for the primitive root modulo m is a generator of the multiplicative group z sub m star. In class, we will look at a few more properties that we can derive regarding the orders of elements and primitive roots. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. In the previous section, we looked at some basic properties of primitive roots modulo m. Let's review the definition. Definition. If g is an integer, and the order of g modulo m is phi of m, we say that g is a primitive root modulo m. The idea of a primitive root is that as you take different powers of it, you cycle through all the elements in the reduced residue system modulo m. This chart shows us all the primitive roots modulo m for various values of m. Notice that some have primitive roots and others don't. If you spent some time sifting through the data, you would eventually discover that there's a pattern for when primitive roots exist. There is a lot of interesting mathematics embedded here, but we will only focus on just a small piece of this result. Theorem. For each prime p, there exist primitive roots modulo p. Consider the reduced residue system zp star, which consists of the numbers 1, 2, up to p minus 1 modulo p, and let n of h denote the number of those integers that have order h. Since we know that if a has order h, then h divides p minus 1, and we know that every element in the reduced residue system has exactly one order, 
we can count all p-1 elements by grouping them together based on their order. We will show that n of h is either 0 or it's phi of h. If n of h is 0, then there's nothing to prove, so suppose that n of h is not equal to 0. Then there exists an a such that a to the h is congruent to 1 modulo p. Now consider the equation x to the h is congruent to 1 mod p. We know this equation has at most h mutually incongruent solutions, but we also know that a, a squared up to a to the h are all solutions that are mutually incongruent, and so we know that there are exactly h solutions. Therefore, all solutions of this equation are of the form a to the r for some r between 1 and h, inclusively. But we know that a to the r has order h if and only if the GCD of r and h is 1, and so there must be exactly phi of h numbers that have order h. In other words, if n of h is not equal to 0, then n of h is equal to phi of h. For any given value of h, we still don't know whether n of h is 0 or phi of h, but we do know that n of h is less than or equal to phi of h for all h. Suppose it were the case that n of h is strictly less than phi of h for some h. Then we would have this inequality. The sum on the right can be evaluated using the result we obtained when looking at arithmetic functions. But when we do that, we see we have a contradiction. This means that n of h equals phi of h for all h dividing p minus 1. In particular, we can see that there are phi of p minus 1 primitive roots modulo p. If we look back at the chart from earlier, we can verify that this is the case. It is important to recognize that while we may know how many primitive roots there are, we have not explored any methods for actually figuring out what they are. There are some techniques that are available that are better than guessing at random, but there is no general formula that allows you to find them. This is something you'll have to explore on your own if you're interested. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The study of prime numbers is perhaps one of the oldest pursuits in number theory. We're going to just barely scratch the surface of it here. The first object we need to look at is the prime counting function pi of x. This function is defined as the number of prime numbers that does not exceed x. We can see a few of the values that it takes in this chart. There are a couple simple observations about this function. First, it is a type of step function. It's constant except possibly at an integer, and it only jumps up if that integer is prime. When there's a jump, it only ever jumps by 1. Second, this is a very irregular function. Because the primes are not distributed in a regular pattern, it is not immediately clear when and how often it will jump up. The challenge for mathematicians was to find a good approximation of this using a smooth function. Gauss was the first to conjecture that x over l and x was the approximation that mathematicians wanted. This was eventually proved true using some fairly advanced techniques involving complex numbers. The proofs of this claim are beyond the scope of this course, so we won't go into any of those details. Instead, we're going to prove some simpler properties of pi of x in order to get a little bit of the flavor of the types of analyses that need to be done to derive information about it. Theorem. The limit as x tends to infinity of pi of x is infinity. Notice that this theorem simply states that there are infinitely many primes. Assume that there are only finitely many primes and label them p1 up through pn, and let m be the product of the primes plus 1. Notice that if we divide m by any of the primes in our list, we get a remainder of 1. This means that none of our primes can divide m. But under the assumption that we've listed all the primes, this would say that m doesn't have a prime factorization, which would contradict the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Therefore, there must be infinitely many primes. We can actually use this process to try to generate an ever-growing list of primes. The value pi of x over x gives an approximation of the proportion of integers less than x that are prime. In many situations, this value is more insightful than just pi of x on its own. We will now prove a quick result that bounds this value from above. This may look like an unusual formula, but formulas of this type are fairly standard in number theory. Theorem. If k is any positive integer, then pi of x over x is less than phi of k over k plus 2k over x. In this proof, we will be using the greatest integer function, which takes a real number x and returns the largest integer that does not exceed x. For example, the greatest integer of 5.9 is 5. Let x be a positive real number and let k be a positive integer. We can divide the greatest integer of x by k using the division algorithm to get that the greatest integer of x is equal to k times q plus r, where 0 is less than equal to r less than k. We will now break apart the integers from 1 through the greatest integer of x into q groups of k consecutive integers, plus one more collection corresponding to the remainder. In the first set of k numbers, we know that there cannot be any more than k primes because there are k total integers in that set. 
We can probably make a better estimate, but it's not necessary for this proof. From among the next set of k numbers, only phi of k of them can be prime. To see why, let's suppose that a is some value in the set that is not relatively prime to k. This means that there must be some common factor of a and k that's greater than 1. But we also know that this common factor of k must be less than k. In other words, there's some number greater than 1 from the first set that divides both a and k, so a cannot be prime. In fact, this logic must be true for all the remaining full rows of k numbers. In the last row, we will once again use the worst case estimate and note that there are most r more primes. Therefore, we must have this inequality. Notice that k times q is less than or equal to x, so that q minus 1 is less than x over k. Also, notice that r is less than k. These substitutions allow us to manipulate the equations a little bit more. In class, we're going to push this equation even further and show that pi of x over x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. In order to do that, we're going to introduce an interesting trick that combines infinite geometric series with the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. This trick is tied to the Euler product formula for the Riemann zeta function, which is an extremely important object in analytic number theory. Unfortunately, it's also well beyond the scope of this class. However, if you search the internet for the Riemann zeta function, you will find plenty of information about it. I recommend the videos by number file as a starting point. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. We've spent a lot of time this semester studying linear congruences. The most natural next step for us is to look at quadratic congruences. And we're going to focus on the simplest possible quadratic congruence. x squared is congruent to a modulo p. Depending on the values of a and p, this will sometimes have a solution and will sometimes not have a solution. This leads us to a definition. Definition. Let p be a prime and a be an integer that is relatively prime to p. If x squared congruent to a modulo p has a solution, we say that a is a quadratic residue modulo p. If it does not, we say that a is a quadratic non-residue modulo p. Before looking at this from a theoretical point of view, let's look at some explicit examples. Here are some charts that show us all the squares modulo p for different values of p. You can see that we've taken the reduced residue system zp star and just squared all the terms and listed the results. From here, we can determine whether x squared congruent to a modulo p has a solution by just checking the chart. For example, we can see that x squared congruent to 2 modulo 7 has two solutions, but that x squared congruent to 3 modulo 5 does not have any. In other words, 2 is a quadratic residue modulo 7, and 3 is a quadratic non-residue modulo 5. It turns out that there is a method for determining whether a is a quadratic residue or non-residue modulo p that does not require us to calculate the full list of squares and search for the answers. Theorem. Let p be a prime. The number a is a quadratic residue modulo p if and only if a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Suppose that a is a quadratic residue modulo p. Then there exists an x such that x squared is congruent to a mod p. Since p does not divide a, we know that p does not divide x. Therefore, by Euler's theorem, we know that x to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. By substituting, we get that a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Now suppose that a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1 modulo p, and let g be a primitive root modulo p. There exists an integer r such that g to the r is congruent to a mod p. By substitution, we get that g to the r over 2 times p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Since the order of g is p minus 1, we know that p minus 1 divides r over 2 times p minus 1, which implies that r over 2 must be an integer. In other words, r equals 2s for some integer s. If we let x equal g to the s, we can see that x squared is congruent to a modulo p, so that a is a quadratic residue modulo p. We can look back at our previous observations and verify that this works. Is 2 a quadratic residue modulo 7? We know that it is by looking at the chart, but we can also use the theorem and do the calculation. Similarly, we can see that 3 is not a quadratic residue modulo 5 by calculation. This may seem a little bit excessive for small moduli because it can be faster to just square a few numbers and check. However, this theorem gives us an explicit calculation to determine directly whether or not something is a quadratic residue. It also gives us a theoretical tool that we can use in proofs. The proof we completed also gives us a quick corollary. Corollary. Let g be a primitive root modulo p and assume that the GCD of a and p is 1. Let r be any integer such that g to the r is congruent to a modulo p. Then r is even if and only if a is a quadratic residue mod p. 
The book doesn't discuss this, but there's a very real challenge in using Euler's criterion in practice. Let's say we wanted to know whether 2639 is a quadratic residue modulo 7297. This would require us to calculate 2639 to the 3648th power, which is a number that is nearly 12,500 digits long. So we need some sort of technique for making these numbers more accessible to us. In class, we will discuss a method known as successive squaring, which will make these values computable with just the basic calculator. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The Legendre symbol is a useful notation to help us work through calculations involving quadratic residues. This symbol is read as A on P, and is always written like a fraction inside of parentheses. Definition. If P is an odd prime, then A on P is equal to 1 if A is a quadratic residue modulo P, it's 0 if P divides A, and negative 1 otherwise. We will now prove some basic properties of the Legendre symbol. Theorem. If P is an odd prime and A and B are relatively prime to P, then these three equations hold. The first equation is true just by the definitions and the basic arithmetic facts about congruences. When working modulo P, we can freely replace one symbol with another that is equivalent to it, modulo P. The second equation is true because of the corollary at the end of the previous section. It comes down to checking four cases and think about whether the exponents are even or odd. This is how the logic looks when both A and B are quadratic residues modulo P. In this case, if G is a primitive root modulo P, we must have that A and B are equivalent to G raised to an even power. When we multiply these together, we get that AB is equivalent to G raised to an even power, which implies that AB is a quadratic residue modulo P. The logic is similar for the other three cases. We won't talk through all the details because it's just a matter of talking about even and odd exponents. For the third equation, we also need to look at cases. If P divides A, then the Legendre symbol is zero by definition, and we can see that A to the P minus one over two is congruent to zero mod P by direct calculation. Combining these two statements together proves the result. If P does not divide A, then we must have A to the P minus one over two is congruent to plus or minus one mod P. We will then use the Euler's criterion to investigate the two situations. If A is a quadratic residue modulo P, then the Legendre symbol is equal to 1, and Euler's criterion directly tells us that A to the P minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1 modulo P, which gives us the result. If A is not a quadratic residue modulo P, then the Legendre symbol is negative 1, and Euler's criterion tells us that A to the P minus 1 over 2 is not congruent to 1 modulo P. By the observation above, this shows us that A to the P minus 1 over 2 is congruent to negative 1 mod P, which gives us the result. It turns out that we can extend this definition to include non-primes. The symbol we use is known as the Jacobi symbol, and it looks identical to the Legendre symbol. Although this may initially seem confusing, the way things are defined turns out to be a very natural extension. Definition. Suppose m is an odd integer. Write m as a product of odd primes, not necessarily all distinct, and we can define the Jacobi symbol using this formula. The symbols on the right-hand side of the equal sign are Legendre symbols. We won't do a lot with this right now, but it turns out to have some applications similar to the things we'll be seeing in the upcoming sections. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. The law of quadratic reciprocity is a fascinating theorem that can be discovered by looking at the values of q on p when p and q are primes. Before looking at the details of the statement and its proof, we're going to take a look at the pattern itself. Here's a chart of the values of the Legendre symbol, q on p, where p and q are primes. In order to make this a little more visually appealing, we will color the plus one values green and the minus one values red. You can see that the chart is almost symmetric across the diagonal, but not quite. For example, if we look at the row and column corresponding to the value five, we can see they match up perfectly. But if we look at seven, we see that it only matches sometimes. In order to try to understand this, Let's see what happens when we only highlight the positions that fail to be symmetric. This coloration makes it possible to see the pattern. If we look at only the primes associated with these rows and these columns, a very strong pattern appears. The only time the chart fails to have symmetry is when both P and Q are congruent to 3 modulo 4, and this leads us to the insight into the statement of quadratic reciprocity. Of course, the observation of the pattern and the proof are two separate steps, but before we can get into the details of the proof, we need to set up a few preliminaries. Definition. If n is any integer, then the least residue of n modulo m is the integer x in the interval negative m over 2 to m over 2 such that n is congruent to x modulo m. 
we denote the least residue of n modulo m by lr sub m of n. This chart shows the list of complete residues modulo m for a few values of m. As you can see, the end result of using these values instead of the standard zm values is that all the numbers are as small as possible in absolute value. It will turn out that we are primarily interested in the signs of these values. Definition. For any real number x, we define the sign of x to be 1 if x is greater than 0, 0 if x is 0, and negative 1 if x is less than 0. The book calls this the signum of x, but basically everyone just calls it the sign of x. Just as a quick observation, notice that x is equal to the absolute value of x times the sine of x for any real number x. Before looking at the formal proof of Gauss's lemma, we're going to look at a numerical example of the idea. Gauss's lemma basically takes the first p minus 1 over 2 multiples of some integer m, reduces them to the least residues, and then counts the number of negative signs. For example, let m equal 4 and p equal 11. Here are the first five multiples of 4. We now want to reduce this module 11 using the least residues as the representations. Notice that by doing this, we ended up with all the numbers from 1 through 5, just in a different order, and possibly with a negative sign. Gauss's lemma counts up the negative signs and uses that value to determine the Legendre symbol. The proof from here looks a lot like the proof of Fermat's little theorem, in that we're going to multiply the list of values together in two different ways. If we multiply the original list together, we get this. If we multiply the list of least residues together, we get this. Since both of these are the same list module 11, we must have these two expressions are equivalent. We can then cancel out the 5 factorial and apply Euler's criterion to the left hand side. Of course, we can see that 4 is a quadratic residue module 11 since 2 squared equals 4, but that's not the point. The method demonstrated above works in general. Theorem. Let the gsd of m and p equal 1, where p is an odd prime, and let mu be the number of integers in the set m, 2m, up to p minus 1 over 2 times m, whose least residues modulo p are negative. Then m on p is equal to negative 1 to the mu power. The first observation we need to make is that all of the least residues in the list of multiples of m are different. Suppose that a times m is congruent to plus or minus b times m modulo p, where a and b are between 1 and p minus 1 over 2. Then since the GCD of m and p is 1, we have that a is congruent to plus or minus b mod p. But since a and b are both positive and less than p minus 1 over 2, they must actually be equal. Therefore, this list reduces to the following collection of least residues. We don't know exactly which values have a negative sign, but we do know that there are mu of them. We now multiply the multiples of m together, and we multiply the list of least residues together. These are equivalent to each other modulo p. We can divide out the p minus 1 over 2 factorial from both sides and apply Euler's criterion to conclude the desired result. We can actually convert the equivalence to an equal sign because the actual value of both expressions is plus or minus 1. In the next video, we will see how to use this observation to prove quadratic reciprocity. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. In the previous video, we discovered the law of quadratic reciprocity by looking at the nearly symmetric table of Legendre symbols q on p, where p and q are prime. Specifically, we saw that a pattern arose if we focused on where the symmetry was broken. Then we proved Gauss's lemma. Gauss's lemma is an important stepping stone for the proof of quadratic reciprocity presented in the book. It's worth noting that there are about a couple hundred different proofs of quadratic reciprocity, and so this is one of those theorems that can be a launching point for all types of mathematics. Theorem. If p and q are distinct odd primes, then we have p on q is equal to q on p, unless p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4, in which case they are different. Notice that in the case that p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4, we could also say that p on q is equal to negative q on p. To prove the theorem, let mu1 be the number of multiples of q in the set q 2q up to p minus 1 over 2 times q, whose least residues modulo p are negative. And let mu2 be the number of multiples of p in the set p 2p up to q minus 1 over 2 times p, whose least residues modulo q are negative. Then by Gauss's lemma, we can calculate each of these Legendre symbols in terms of mu1 and mu2. We can then multiply these equations together. From this equation, we can see that the Legendre symbols are the same if and only if mu1 plus mu2 is even. In other words, the Legendre symbols are different if and only if mu1 plus mu2 is odd. Therefore, our goal is to show that mu1 plus mu2 is odd if and only if p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4. Our proof will be geometric. We will find two ways of counting the same set of lattice points in a certain region. 
The first time we count them, we will show that there is an odd number of points if and only if p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4. The second time we count them, we will show that there are mu1 plus mu2 lattice points. Putting these two statements together will give us the result. The region we will be investigating is a diagonal strip of a rectangle on the plane. The rectangle is defined by these equations. The diagonal strip will be the region between these two lines. We have written the second equation in a non-standard way to demonstrate the underlying symmetry. However, for the sake of visualizing the picture, we will also write it in slope-intercept form. From this, we can see that the two lines are parallel. The key observation is that if the lattice point mn is in the region, then the reflection of this point through p plus 1 over 4, q plus 1 over 4, is also a lattice point in the region. To see that this is true, we just need to examine the defining equations. There are a lot of algebraic steps involved in the calculation, so we'll stick to the high-level overview. If the point mn is in the region, then the points mn satisfy these equations. The first two equations can easily be rewritten to show that the point m prime n prime satisfy a similar equation. To see that this is equivalent to the original equations, we need to use the fact that m prime and n prime are integers. We do not introduce any new integers into the interval if we change the lower limit from 1 half down to 0. The upper limit is an integer, so we do not lose any lattice points by reducing that limit by 1 half. The third inequality can be shown through direct substitution. Since the points mn and m prime n prime are reflections of each other, there will be an even number of lattice points in the region provided that the reflection point is not a lattice point. In other words, the only way we can get an odd number of lattice points in the region is if p plus 1 over 4, q plus 1 over 4, is a lattice point. And this can only happen if p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4. And this completes the first way of counting the lattice points. For the second way of counting the lattice points, first notice that since the equation of the diagonal is y equals q over p times x, and since q and p are both odd primes, that there cannot be any lattice points on the diagonal. Let's count the lattice points mn in the region below the diagonal. We will fix the x-coordinate at some integer m. The y-coordinate n must lie between the two lines so that this is the required condition. After some manipulations, we can rewrite the condition in a more compact manner. Notice that the term in the middle is equivalent to np modulo m. Furthermore, it shows that there is a point in the region below the line if and only if there is a number between negative q over 2 and 0 that is equivalent to np modulo m. This is the same as saying that the least residue of np modulo m is negative. In other words, each lattice point in the region below the diagonal corresponds to a point in the set p 2p up to q minus 1 over 2 times p whose least residue is negative. Also, each of these terms whose least residue is negative must appear as a lattice point in the region since we can find an integer m that satisfies the inequality. Recall that mu2 was defined as the number of values in the set that have a negative least residue. This means that there are mu2 points in this region. The same argument works for the upper region, which would show that there are mu1 lattice points in the region above the diagonal. And therefore, there are mu1 plus mu2 points in the region, which completes the second way of counting the points and completes the proof. Since this proof is long and involves a lot of ideas, let's recap the main steps of the proof. We started off by using Gauss's lemma, which states that we can determine the value of the Legendre symbol p on q by determining mu1 and mu2. The values mu1 and mu2 correspond to the number of negative signs in specific sets of multiples of q and p. We use this to show that p on q and q on p are different if and only if mu1 plus mu2 is odd. We then counted the number of lattice points in a particular region in two different ways. One way showed that the number of lattice points is odd if and only if p and q are both equivalent to 3 modulo 4. The second way shows that the number of lattice points in the region is exactly mu1 plus mu2, and this gave us what we needed to prove the result. This proof is a little bit complicated, and you may need to watch the video a couple times to really understand it. Here's a full summary of the example that was used as the model with explicit calculations. It might help to work through the steps of the proof using this image to explicitly see where all the different values come from. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Although the law of quadratic reciprocity only directly tells us about congruences modulo primes, it turns out that we can extend the ideas to other moduli. The first place to look for generalizations is at powers of primes. These are the lists of perfect squares modulo powers of 3 and 5. 
The pattern may not be immediately apparent, but if we write out all the elements of Z27 and Z25 in rows of 3 and 5 respectively, it becomes quite clear. We've boxed the quadratic residues and grayed out the terms that are not relatively prime to the modulus. The fact that everything lines up this way is a very interesting pattern that holds true in general. Theorem. If P is an odd prime and the GCD of A and P is 1, then the congruence x squared congruent A modulo P to the N has a solution if and only if A on P is equal to 1. First, notice that if the congruence x squared congruent A modulo P to the N has a solution, then we can reduce the equation modulo P to get a solution to x squared congruent A modulo P. Therefore, if A on P is equal to negative 1, then x squared congruent to A modulo P to the N cannot have any solutions. Now suppose that A on P is equal to 1. We will prove the claim by induction on the power of the prime. When n equals 1, the assumption directly tells us that there exists a solution. Assume that x squared congruent to a modulo p to the k has a solution x0. This means that x0 squared minus a is equal to m times p to the k for some integer m. We will now generate a solution of x squared congruent to a modulo p to the k plus 1. Let x0 prime be the inverse of x0 modulo p. Then x0 times x0 prime is equal to 1 plus rp for some integer r. Given this collection of symbols, we claim that we can write down a solution to the desired congruence. The proof is a direct calculation by showing that this expression is divisible by p to the k plus 1. There is a lot of algebra here, but there's nothing fancy happening. We start off by squaring the first term. Using the relationship above, we can substitute for x0 times x0 prime. We can also rearrange the minus a term and put it next to the x0 squared term to allow us to use the inductive hypothesis and make another substitution. Next, we expand out the middle term in order to get some cancellation. Notice that we can pull out a factor of p to the k plus 1 from the entire expression, which is what we were trying to accomplish. Technically, this calculation doesn't really involve the law of quadratic reciprocity. It's just an example of a calculation that involves quadratic residues. In class, we'll look at some calculations that do directly use the law of quadratic reciprocity. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Now that we've got some experience with quadratic residues, we can start to look for some patterns. Here's a chart containing the quadratic residues modulo 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and 19. There are a lot of places to look for patterns among these values. A surprising pattern arises when we count the pairs of consecutive quadratic residues. If we imagine that quadratic residues and non-residues are essentially random, we would conclude that about a fourth of the time we would get consecutive residues. This is pretty close, and it turns out that we can get an exact formula. Theorem. We have an explicit formula for n of p, where n of p denotes the number of pairs of consecutive quadratic residues modulo p in the interval from 1 to p minus 1. We will save the proof of this theorem for class. This video will be spent up building up the machinery that we'll need. These results are interesting on their own, as sums of this type have applications in other problems. The first theorem we'll prove is basically obvious once you understand what it says. Theorem. Suppose cj is defined for all integers j, and cj equals ck whenever j is congruent to k modulo n. Let r1, r2 up to rn be any complete residue system modulo n. Then this formula must be true. This is just a fancy way of saying that under the right conditions, we can substitute the terms in a sum with representatives from any complete residue system. Notice that the set from 0 to n minus 1 and the set of r sub i are both complete residue systems. That means there is a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence between the two sets, depending on the residue modulo n. Since cj is equal to ck whenever j is congruent to k modulo n, we can see that the two sums have the exact same summands. Because of this, we have an alternate presentation of the summation notation that will help us to stay organized for the calculations that are coming up. We can read this as the sum over all residues modulo n. The theorem that we just proved shows that it doesn't matter which complete residue system we use as long as the cj satisfy the given property. Theorem. If p is an odd prime, then this formula holds. The value of this theorem is that it gives us access to working with sums of products of Legendre symbols. It may seem like a strange sum to consider, but we'll see that it arises somewhat naturally in the proof of the theorem to come. The proof of this theorem is actually an exercise in fancy bookkeeping but highlight some of the standard techniques that are used in these types of calculations. We start off by observing that we can write the sum using the notation we just introduced. Notice that as n runs through all the values in a complete residue system, that n plus a must run through all the values as well. This means that we can substitute n plus a for n without changing the sum at all. This form will be easier for us to work with. 
If a is congruent to b modulo p, then we can compute the sum directly. So suppose that a is not congruent to b modulo p. To simplify the notation, let lambda equal a minus b. Notice that when n is congruent to 0 modulo p, that the Lissandra symbol is 0, and so we can pull that term out of the sum. Now that we are working with terms where n is not congruent to 0 modulo p, for each value of n in the sum, there exists an n prime such that n times n prime is congruent to 1 modulo p. Also, n prime squared on p is equal to 1, so we can multiply each of the sum n's by this without changing the value and rewrite the terms once again. Notice that as n runs through all the non-zero values in a reduced residue system, n prime must also run through all the non-zero values. And since lambda is not congruent to zero modulo p, n prime times lambda must run through all the non-zero values as well. We will let m equal n prime lambda for notational clarity. We will now reinsert the m congruent to zero modulo p term into the sum. But notice that this creates an extra non-zero term, so we'll need to subtract that off. The first term is simply the sum of all the Legendre symbols modulo p. Since there are an equal number of quadratic residues as quadratic non-residues, these terms will all cancel out. Also, 1 on p is equal to 1, and this gets us to the desired conclusion. This proof is another very technical number theory proof. It takes a lot of experience before working with these sums feels natural. For now, the goal is that you would be able to follow along with all the substitutions and manipulations. You may want to go through the string of equations and see how many of the steps you actually feel comfortable explaining yourself to get a sense of how well you follow along. This theorem is actually more general than what we need for the proof coming up in class, but proving the general statement is just as difficult as proving the special case. Also, it's hard at this point to really appreciate how surprising and powerful a result this is. These types of sums have important applications to higher levels of number theory. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. In the previous class, we looked at a theorem about consecutive pairs of quadratic residues modulo p. It turns out that we can prove a similar result regarding consecutive triples of quadratic residues. While this proof is admittedly even more technical and more difficult than the ones from the previous section, there is a surprising corollary of the proof that we will need moving forward. Because of the length of the proof, it will be done in two sections. Definition. Let nu of p denote the number of consecutive triples of quadratic residues in the interval 1 to p minus 1. Theorem. If p is an odd prime, the nu of p is equal to p over 8 plus an error term, where the error is less than 1 fourth squared of p plus 2. Unlike the statement for pairs of consecutive residues, we do not have an exact formula, but we do have an estimate on the size of the error. We will start off in a manner similar to the proof in the previous section. We first define c sub p of n as the function that counts the consecutive triples of quadratic residues. This gives us a formula for nu of p. Just as before, we can write an explicit equation for c sub p of n using Legendre symbols. We can plug this into the equation for nu of p and expand the product to get a long algebraic expression to work with. The first seven of these sums are a type that we saw in the previous section. We will fill out the sums so that they are sums over a complete set of residues and then use our previous results to simplify it. Here are all the calculations. We won't be talking through them individually. We will move the p over 8 term to the left side and define the remaining quantity to be the error term. We will bound this above by maximizing all of the individually bracketed terms from the middle part with all the Legendre symbols. We will also round up the constant term because it's easier and doesn't have a significant impact on the end result. From here, we can see that the remaining challenge is to evaluate the sum of the products of consecutive Legendre symbols. Specifically, we must prove this inequality. In the next video, we will do that and finish the proof. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. We ended the previous video in the middle of the proof of the following theorem. Theorem. If p is an odd prime, then nu of p is equal to p over 8 plus an error term, where the error is less than 1 fourth square root of p plus 2. We had gotten to this equation and observed that we needed to bound the sum by 2 times the square root of p in order to complete the proof. In order to do that, we're going to define a new function s of m. First, notice that we can manipulate s of 1 to a more useful form. After factoring and shifting the index, we see that this is the expression that we need to bound in order to complete the proof. For us to do this, we're going to show that s of m has certain properties that we can use to estimate its value. First, we break the sum into two parts and use symmetry to help us to simplify it. 
We will rewrite the second sum by taking n prime equals p minus 1 minus n, and noting that as n runs from p plus 1 over 2 to p minus 1, n prime runs through the values 1 through p minus 1 over 2. After reducing modulo p, we can factor out the negative 1 in front of the n prime in the Legendre symbol and simplify the negative n prime squared term. Notice that when p is congruent to 3 modulo 4, we have that negative 1 on p is negative 1, so that s of m is equal to 0 in this case. This gives us a very tight bound on the error for these primes. We will now focus on the case where p is congruent to 1 modulo 4, which means that negative 1 on p is equal to 1. Because of this, we can combine the two sums together. This shows that s of m is always even, which is a fact that we'll come back to later, but it doesn't actually help us calculate its value. We are going to return to the original equation and show that s of m has a functional relationship with itself. Suppose k is an integer such that k is not congruent to 0 modulo p, then k to the fourth on p is equal to 1, and we can multiply this through without changing the values. After using the multiplicative property of the Legendre symbols a couple times, we end up with a form that suggests a variable change. Let h equal kn, and notice that as n runs through all the values in a complete residue system modulo p, so does h. And this gives us the functional equation. Now suppose that j is a quadratic residue modulo p. Then there exists a c such that j is congruent to c squared mod p, and we will use this to evaluate another expression for s of 1. Notice that this implies that the absolute value of s of 1 is equal to the absolute value of s of j. Now suppose that L and L prime are quadratic non-residues modulo p. If g is a primitive root modulo p, then we must have that L and L prime are odd powers of g. Without loss of generality, we will assume that b is greater than or equal to a. Then we can let t equal g to the b minus a so that L prime is congruent to Lt squared modulo p. We can apply the functional equation again to see that the absolute value of s of L is equal to the absolute value of s of L prime. What these two calculations show is that the size of s of m is only dependent upon whether m is a quadratic residue or non-residue modulo p. Therefore, since we know that there are p minus 1 over 2 quadratic residues and p minus 1 over 2 quadratic non-residues, we must have this equation. Before we launch into another series of manipulations, we want to note that s of 0 is equal to 0. With this fact established, we will manipulate the left side of the equation. We can add in the s of 0 term without changing the sum. And then after explicitly substituting in the formula for s of m, we can rewrite it like this. We can now apply a result from the previous section on the innermost sum. The next several steps are mostly simple rearrangements and substitutions. In the last step, we use the fact that p is congruent to 1 modulo 4 to conclude that both s squared and negative s squared are quadratic residues modulo p. When we substitute this back into the equation we were working with, we find that we get the result we've been seeking. This calculation also gives us an important corollary. Corollary. Every prime p congruent to 1 modulo 4 is representable as a sum of two square integers. In fact, we even have an explicit formula for this. The only observation we need to make is that s of m is always even, which means that these quantities are always integers. This is the most technical proof for the entire class. You may have to watch this several times and pause for a while to work through the details of the long calculation in order to really understand all the bits and pieces that come together to make this proof work. Despite the level of technicality, this is a proof that you should be able to understand fully if you take the time to work through it. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. In our long and complex proof of the estimate for the number of consecutive triples of quadratic residues modulo p, we ended up with an explicit formula for writing a 1 modulo 4 prime as the sum of two squares. Once we have this result, a natural question that arises is what other numbers we can write as a sum of two squares, and this leads us to the main result of the section. Theorem. A positive integer n can be represented as the sum of two squares if and only if its factorizations into powers of distinct primes contains no odd powers of primes congruent to 3 modulo 4. We will prove the forward direction by contradiction. Suppose that the prime factorization of n has a 3 modulo 4 prime q raised to an odd power, and suppose that n equals x squared plus y squared. We can make a collection of substitutions to divide up by the greatest common factor of x and y in order to simplify the equation. Since the exponent of q in the factorization of n is odd, it will remain odd after dividing by a perfect square. This means that the exponent of q in n1 must also be odd. Furthermore, we know that q cannot divide either x naught or y naught 
because otherwise it would have to divide both, and we've already divided out all the common factors. This implies that there exists a u such that x0 is congruent to u times y0 mod q. After substituting, we get that q must divide 1 plus u squared times y0 squared. Since we've already shown that q does not divide y0, we must have that q divides 1 plus u squared. In other words, u squared is congruent to negative 1 modulo q. But this implies that negative 1 is a quadratic residue modulo q, which is false since q is congruent to 3 modulo 4. Therefore, the assumption that we can write n as a sum of squares is wrong, and all the 3 modulo 4 primes in the factorization of n must be raised to even powers. We will now prove the other direction. The key to this part of the proof is that the product of two sums of squares is expressible as the sum of squares itself. Also note that we have these equations. As long as each 3 mod 4 prime is raised to an even power, we can use these equations with the identity to write the number n as a sum of two squares. In class, we will be using some of these ideas to explore a question related to the Pythagorean theorem. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. We've seen that we can only write certain natural numbers as the sum of two squares. How many squares would we need in order to write every single natural number? With a little bit of experimentation, you will find that you can't write the number 7 as the sum of 3 squares, but you can do it with 4, and it turns out that 4 is enough for any natural number. But in order to prove it, we must first prove a lemma about sum of 3 squares. Theorem. For each prime p, there exist integers a, b, and c, not all 0, such that a squared plus b squared plus c squared is congruent to 0 modulo p. If p equals 2, we can take a and b equal to 1, and c equal to 0. If p is congruent to 1 mod 4, we know that there exists an integer a such that a squared is congruent to negative 1 modulo p. We can then solve the equation by taking b equal to 1 and c equal to 0. If p is congruent to 3 mod 4, let d be the least positive non-residue modulo p. Notice that d is greater than or equal to 2 since 1 is always a quadratic residue. And since d is the least positive non-residue, we know that d minus 1 must be a quadratic residue. So we can find an a such that a squared is congruent to d minus 1 modulo p. Next, notice that negative d is a quadratic residue, so that we can find a b such that b squared is congruent to negative d modulo p. By adding these two equations together, we get that a squared plus b squared plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p, which shows that we can take c equal to 1 to satisfy the theorem. We will now proceed to prove the main result. The method that we will use is known as the method of descent. The way this works is that we'll create an equation with a parameter capital K in it, where capital K is some positive integer, and where the theorem will be proven if capital K equals 1. We will then show that if capital K is greater than 1, we can solve the equation with a parameter little k that's smaller than capital K. By doing this repeatedly, we will get a decreasing sequence of positive integers, which means at some point the sequence must reach k equal 1. This should feel a bit like induction because it's logically equivalent to it. The technical name of the property we're using is the well-ordering principle, which states that any non-empty set of natural numbers has a least element. Theorem. Every positive integer is a sum of four non-negative integral squares. First, notice that this mathematical identity proves that the product of two sums of four squares can be written as the sum of four squares. This means that we only need to prove that all primes can be written as the sum of four squares because we can build up all other natural numbers from the primes. We can use the result of the previous section to prove that 2 and 1 modulo 4 primes can be expressed as the sum of 4 squares, since they can be expressed as the sum of just 2 squares. However, the proof that we would use for 3 mod 4 primes works for all primes, so we will do them all in one step. By the previous theorem, for any prime p there exist integers a, b, and c, not all 0, such that a squared plus b squared plus c squared is congruent to 0 modulo p. This means that we can solve an equation of the form a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared is equal to capital K times p for some capital K greater than or equal to 1 by taking d equal to 0. Notice that if k is equal to 1, we're done with the proof. We can pick a, b, c, and d to be between 0 and p over 2 by taking them to be the absolute value of their least residue modulo p. Therefore, the sum of these four squares can be taken to be less than p squared, which shows that we can take capital K to be less than p. Suppose that capital K is greater than 1 and is odd. We will pick four new variables, a, b, c, and d, so that they're all between 0 and capital K over 2, and that they're equivalent to their corresponding capital letter modulo K. By substituting this into the previous equation, 
and reducing modulo capital K, we can see that there exists an integer little k, such that little a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared is equal to capital K times little k. Since each of the variables little a, b, c, and d are less than capital K over 2, we know that little k is less than capital K from the same logic we applied previously. If it were the case that little k is equal to 0, then little a, b, c, and d would all be 0. So by the equivalences, we find that capital K divides capital A, B, C, and D, so that capital K squared divides capital K times P. But this implies that capital K divides P, which is impossible because capital K is strictly between 1 and P. Therefore, we must have that little k must be positive. Now notice that we can multiply capital K times P and capital K times little k together and use the sum of the four squares formula to get a nice result. Each of the quantities inside of the parentheses is divisible by capital K, and this can be verified by straightforward calculation. Therefore, there are just integers alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, such that little k times little p is equal to alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared plus delta squared. This shows that we can write little k times p as a sum of four squares where little k is less than capital K. And this shows the descent happens when capital K is odd and capital K is greater than one. We will now consider the case that capital K is even. We need to return to the original equation for this. In order for the left side to be even, there are three possibilities. All the quantities are odd, all the quantities are even, or two of the quantities are even and two of the quantities are odd. By relabeling the terms, we can always end up with the first two terms being of the same parity and the last two terms being of the same parity. We can use an algebraic trick to rewrite the equation in a helpful manner. Notice that all the terms in parentheses are integers. Therefore, whenever capital K is greater than 1, we can take the equation of the form capital A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared equals capital K times P and generate an equation little a squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared equals little k times P where little k is less than capital K. So by the method of descent, it is possible to write P as a sum of four squares and this proves the theorem. It is possible to use the method of descent to generate another proof that one mod four primes can be written as a sum of two squares. We will look at some of the elements of that proof in class. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. For the last chapter of this class, we're going to look at some questions about lattice points. Recall that lattice points are points of the form x, y on the plane where x and y are both integers. We ran into these in our proof of quadratic reciprocity when we needed to count the number of points in a certain region in a couple different ways. Lattice points hold the answers to other number theoretic questions as well. Gauss's circle problem is an attempt to determine the average number of ways we can write the natural number n as the sum of two squares. In this case, we're looking at all integer solutions, not just natural number solutions. Let's formalize this. We let r sub 2 of n be the number of ways to write the natural number n as the sum of two square integers. Here's a chart that has the first few values. The way we understand taking the average of an infinite list of values like this is actually to take the average for the first n values and then take the limit as n tends to infinity. This takes us to the statement of the theorem. Theorem, the limit as n tends to infinity of 1 over n times the sum of r sub 2 of n is equal to pi. The hint as to why the number pi shows up in this equation is because we're looking at equations of the form x squared plus y squared equals n, and these graphs represent circles of radius squared of n. For each solution, you can see that there's a corresponding lattice point for the appropriate value of n. With this picture in mind, it should not be surprising that we end up with something involving a pi. The proof uses a combination of algebra and geometry. In fact, this proof gives us a glimpse into an area of mathematics known as the geometry of numbers. In its simplest understanding, it's using geometric facts to tell us information about the properties of numbers. To begin the proof, we will let c of n denote the set of points satisfying x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to n. In other words, it's the set of points in the plane on or inside the circle of radius square root of n. Clearly, this sum is the number of lattice points in C of n. In other words, the challenge is to determine how many lattice points there are in a circle of radius square root of n. For each lattice point q in C of n, we will associate the unit square of which q is the upper left corner, and we will let p of n denote the union of all of these squares. Notice that since each point corresponds to a square of area 1, we have another way to compute this sum. We will now bound the area of this region above and below using circles. Consider the regions p of n and c of n. Notice that each point in p of n is no more than a distance of square root of 2 away from a lattice point in c of n. 
This implies that p of n must be fully contained inside the circle with radius square root of n plus square root of 2. Similarly, we can see that the region p of n must contain a circle centered at the origin of radius square root of n minus square root of 2. This gives us an upper bound and a lower bound for the area of p of n. And from here, it's just some substitutions in algebra. Once we've rewritten the equation in this form, we see that the upper and lower bounds approach zero as n approaches infinity, so we must have that the middle quantity does as well. But that's equivalent to our desired result. In class, we will introduce the big O notation, which is a different way of trying to talk about the estimates of the values of functions like these. Basically, it gives us a more accurate way to talk about the behavior of a function in the limit. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. Dirichlet's divisor problem is similar to Gauss's circle problem in that we're trying to determine the average of a function using geometry. In this case, the problem is finding the average number of divisors. There are two functions that we will need to introduce. The first is known as the floor function, or the greatest integer function. Definition. The floor of x is defined to be the largest integer that does not exceed x. This function basically rounds a number down to the next integer. For example, the floor of 1.9 is equal to 1, and the floor of 4 is equal to 4. There is sometimes some confusion when computing the floor of negative numbers, but that won't be relevant for our calculations. As a side note, the book uses full square brackets, but the modern notation is to just use the lower bracket. The second function is the fractional part of x, which gives us the leftover after pulling up the integer part. Definition. The fractional part of x is defined as x minus the floor of x. We can equivalently define this as the floor of x is equal to x minus the fractional part of x. Notice that the fractional part is always a positive value. We will now look into the divisor problem. Theorem. There exists a constant c such that the sum of d of n is equal to n times ln of n plus c times n plus o of the square root of n. If we divide through by n, this says that the average number of divisors is approximately ln of n plus a constant. This situation is similar to the one in the previous section in that we're just looking at lattice points inside specific regions. In this case, we're going to restrict our attention to the first quadrant since the divisors are always positive, and we'll be working with hyperbolas instead of circles. Notice that d of n counts the number of lattice points in the first quadrant lying on the hyperbola x times y is equal to n. This means that the sum of d of n is the number of lattice points in the first quadrant on or below the hyperbola x times y is equal to capital N. We can break that region into three parts. The first part is the square of side length square root of n, whose corners touch the origin and the point root n root n. This is the part that's shaded darker in this diagram. The other two connected regions are the other two parts. Notice that the symmetry of the equation implies that these lighter regions have the same number of lattice points. The lattice points in the square are easy to count. There are the floor of square root of n squared of them. To count the lattice points in the upper region, we will count the lattice points along the vertical line x equal n that are above the square. We know that the line touches the hyperbola at the height of capital N over little n, so that there are the floor of capital N over little n lattice points below the hyperbola on the line. But the ones that are below root capital N are in the square and have already been counted, so we need to subtract these off. This means that each vertical line contains the floor of capital N over little n minus the floor of the square root of capital N points in the region. The sum of d of n from 1 to capital N is the number of lattice points below the curve x times y is equal to capital N. And based on the counting scheme above, we have a formula to compute that quantity. We can simplify this a bit by separating the sum. And we can now rewrite the greatest integer parts in terms of the fractional part. From here, we can start picking off the error terms. The second term is a sum of no more than root n terms that are no greater than 1, so this is O of root n. The fourth term is root n multiplied by a constant that's less than 1, so this is also O of root n. The last term is always less than 1, so this can be absorbed into the O of root n error. In order to estimate the sum, we will use a result from calculus. The book proves this in the appendix if you want to go through the details. For our application, we will first rearrange the equation and then use f of t equals 1 over t and capital M equals square root of n. We can now substitute this into our previous equation and simplify to get the result. This proof demonstrates a few of the techniques that are common in these types of proofs. For example, the big O analysis part where we combine multiple big O terms together is something that you would get used to if you were to continue in number theory. Using the integral test to help you evaluate the sum is also common. 
However, we do not have time in this class to delve further into this. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future. If you've made it through all the videos, congratulations. And if you aren't even in the class and made it through all the videos, double congratulations to you. I wanted to make one more video to wrap things up and show some of the highlights of the semester. We started off in Chapter 1 discussing the principle of mathematical induction, which is a technique that we can use to prove an infinite number of statements with a finite amount of work. Mathematical induction is used in virtually every area of mathematics, and so it's an important foundation to have. We compared it to knocking down a line of dominoes. If you knock the first one over, and each one is guaranteed to knock the next one over, then all the dominoes will fall down. Chapter 2 discussed the visibility and the Euclidean algorithm. In this chapter, we saw how to determine whether linear Diophantine equations had solutions, and we also used the Euclidean algorithm to find them when they did. We also looked at the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which tells us that all natural numbers greater than 1 have unique prime factorizations. In Chapter 3, we looked at some combinatorial proofs for number-theoretic statements. These are proofs that proceeded by counting numbers of objects in certain ways. We used these techniques to prove two important theorems in number theory, Fermat's Little Theorem and Wilson's Theorem. Chapter 4 introduced congruences. This is a way of reducing the integers down to a finite collection of objects that still follow some of our basic arithmetic ideas. We also introduced the Euler phi function, which counts up the numbers less than n that are relatively prime to n. This function found its way into several future sections. Chapter 5 took a deeper dive into working with congruences. We reproved Fermat's Little Theorem and Wilson's Theorem using a more number theoretic approach. We also proved the Chinese Remainder Theorem, which tells us when we can solve multiple congruences at the same time. Chapter 6 was all about arithmetic functions, which are functions defined on the natural numbers. We learned about a special class of multiplicative arithmetic functions and saw how the Mobius inversion formula creates a type of pairing for these functions. In the process, we saw how we can construct the factors of an integer by breaking it into relatively prime pieces and working with them separately before bringing them back together. This turned out to be a helpful strategy in our proofs. Chapter 7 gave us a look into some of the ideas that are usually seen in abstract algebra. We looked at the orders of elements modulo m and proved that there always exists primitive roots modulo p when p is prime. In Chapter 8, we took a very quick glimpse at the prime counting function and the prime number theorem but we couldn't go deep into that because we required some tools that we don't have at this level. You rarely see this type of analytic number theory unless you get to graduate school in math. Chapter 9 was all about the law of quadratic reciprocity. This is a way of being able to determine when the quadratic congruence x squared congruent to a mod p has a solution. It's one of the deeper results in number theory that has generated a huge amount of new mathematical ideas. Chapter 10 was a chapter that was really quite difficult. We looked at consecutive pairs and triples of quadratic residues modulo p, and in the process we looked at some fairly advanced techniques for working with sums of quadratic residues. The big finale here is that we proved that every one modulo 4 prime can be written as the sum of two squares, and we even had an explicit formula for it. Chapter 11 looked at sums of two squares and sums of four squares. These are two very classical problems in number theory, and in the proof of the sum of four squares we introduced the method of descent. Then we jumped ahead to chapter 15, which gave us a glimpse at how we can use simple geometry to give us number theory facts. Specifically, we learned how to count lattice points in the plane using various techniques. In so doing, we are able to get estimates on the number of ways that we can write numbers as the sum of two squares, as well as the number of divisors the natural number n has. And this brings us to the end of the book and to the end of the class. I hope you enjoyed the videos, and I hope you learned a few things about number theory.